Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Board of Education meeting. Uh, call to order. And the first thing we need to do is review and approve the agenda. And we do have a, a re, uh, revision to make on that. Dr. Litzy? Yes, the revision is that we added an action item under Sachs Middle School. We'll have a presentation tonight uh, from the Sachs Building Committee, architects, and others. And so as an action item, we have a, a move to approve the Sachs Building Committee's recommended project as presented this evening. Terrific. Uh, can I have a motion on an ad for uh, adding that to the agenda? Thank you, Sherry. And a second. Thank you, Jen. All those in favor? And that's unanimous so for the whole group. <clears throat> Moving from there to approving the minutes, and we have the minutes, and I have had them this week. Take a minute while everybody looks at those. Is there, a, uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes. Thank you, Sangeeta. And a second on that. Thank you. Oh, that's right. You were absent. Okay. Thank you for noticing that. And we think. <clears throat> Thank you, Penny. And then a second on that. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Sherry. All those in favor of accepting the minutes the way they are. And that says everybody that's here. If you weren't here, that's okay. That's all right. If you weren't here, that's okay. All right. Now moving on to the next item, which is comments from the public. To ensure the public's right to be heard, the board has set aside time during the meeting for public comments. Two minutes are allotted to each speaker and a maximum of 15 minutes to each subject. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Nowacki, as you know. I am the founder of the New Canaan Taxpayers Association, LLC, a candidate for first selectman in this town, and last week incorporated the League of Registered Voters of New Canaan. I'd like to first start off by saying to Ms. Hobbs, I extend an invitation to you to join a public debate to be conducted at undisclosed dates and you failed to respond. Second thing I'd like to point out is that more than a month ago, uh, I came here and I handed out a series of documents to this group. Not a single person has responded to the issues involved. You will see over the course of the next two weeks in the New Canada Advertiser, a series of comments in regards to the <laughs> lack of the disclosure of the savings long-term of teacher retirements in this town that has built the taxpayers since 1989 of over $60 million. Well documented, you've set up rules that don't declare mm -hmm. retirements until the 1st of April. It falls out of the knowledge of the Board of Selectmen, therefore, and this is nothing more than a scheme or an artifice to defraud the taxpayers of this town of benefits that were never entitled to this group. The last thing I want to say is there is a Connecticut General Statute, which is, Connecticut General Statute 10-248A that says only 1% of the taxpayers of this town have to sign a petition to call a public referendum and a public meeting to discuss these issues since this board of directors refuses to respond. Have a good evening. Is there anyone else who wants to speak? There being no one else who wants to speak, we'll move on to reports and recognition and I see the K-12 assessment report. Dr. Lissy, do you want to introduce that? I would be glad to as Dr. Crenty um, goes to the podium. The, we're, we'll begin tonight with the, the K-12 assessment report, which looks at the, our student performance on the, a variety of assessments that we, we have each year. Uh, as you know, it sort of goes to the heart of our work in many ways as we, we think about curriculum instruction and assessment as being the sort of the triangle of uh, the core of our work, the instructional core. And so we've had some, we've been in some transition over the last couple of years with our CMT and capped and smarter balanced and some other things. So Dr. Crenty will, uh, is gonna spend a little bit of time with this and Mr. Egan as well is gonna talk about some of the high school data. And as you can see, we, we are well represented with our curriculum leadership council. Uh, I wanna say thank you to all of you from the start for being here with us tonight. 
uh, you represent much of the good work that goes into getting the outcomes that we'll be discussing. Uh, and your, your contributions are incredibly valuable. So without uh, going on, I'll turn it over to Dr. Crenty. Good evening. Good evening. I know, Bill. You want me to use the clicker? <laughs> use my <laughs> We're going through a little technology battle over here. Um, first of all, thank you uh, for allowing us to come forward this evening and share our results on standardized assessments. I did want to take an opportunity to introduce the curriculum leaders. Um, this is really our district curriculum committee. It's this committee that leads our curriculum writing and district assessments. And this evening, and maybe you can all just give a little wave. Um, I want to introduce Glenda Green, our Reading K-4 coordinator, Karen Scalzo, our Writing K-5 coordinator, Anita Charger, our LA, our ELA 5 through 8 coordinator, coordinator, Zoe Robinson, our Math K-8 through coordinator, Melinda Meyer, our Science K-8 through coordinator, Mary Hanna, our Social Studies K-8 through coordinator, Evan Remley, our department chair, grades 9 through 12 at the high school. Anthony Bloss, department chair for math, grades 9 through 12. Bob Stevenson, our social studies department chair. Christian Dockham, our science department chair. Jim Zambarano, our CTE department chair. <laughs> Cynthia Rivera, our guidance counselor, uh, department chair. Alan Sneath, part of VPA. Um, and we also have many administrators here with us this evening. Ari Rothman, Larry Sullivan, Ronnie LaDuke, and Bill Egan from the high school. Greg Macedo from Sachs Middle School. Joanne Rocco from South. Jan Murphy, the principal at West. And Chris Wallach, the principal at East. And I am quickly looking to make sure that I didn't forget anybody. I don't think I did. So. Thank you all for being here. Um, they are truly our content experts who really stay current on best practices and really design all the wonderful learning opportunities that we have for our students. They are the people who meet regularly with teachers, who review our curriculum, write our curriculum, and really design our district assessments. Um, the ultimate purpose of assessment is to support and enhance student learning. During the month of March last year, I had the opportunity to share with you the multifaceted way in which we assess students and how we use that data to really drive our instruction. And last year, the main purpose of that presentation was really to concentrate on the district assessments. At that time, we really didn't know how the Smarter Balanced results were going to be reported. Um, and we were still waiting for many of the other information to arrive. So tonight, Mr. Egan and I are prepared to present an overview of the various standardized assessments and those, all of those results. You'll hear about the Smarter Balance the CMT, the CAP, the SAT, the AP, and the ACT. There'll just be a little quiz at the end on all the acronyms, so <laughs> pay close attention. Um, but we really want to give you an idea of how we look at these results, how we interpret these results, how we analyze these results, and then how we use those results. Um, just some points to remember about annual state testing. We know by federal and state law, we are required to universally assess students in English language arts and mathematics in grades three through eight and once in high school. Um, we must also assess students in science in grades five, eight, and 10. And we do have a responsibility for administering all of the state assessments um, to all of our students. So annual state testing is intended to, to describe student achievement and growth as part of program evaluation and school, district, and state accountability systems. It's also intended to provide annual snapshots of student achievement. However, this snapshot must be used with district assessments when making educational decisions. Annual state testing is not useful as a sole measure of student achievement program evaluation of school, district, and state accountability systems. Annual state testing is not useful as a source of guidance for our curriculum and instruction. Teaching to the test is never quality instruction and does not result in long-lasting learning. 
we must use a wide variety of assessments to assess our students and their learning. And that is really going to come back to our district assessments, our student work portfolios, our progress monitoring data, our teacher observations, our universal screenings, and our diagnostic assessments. So when we receive our standardized test results, we're always triangulating that data, trying to make sense of it, trying to look at individual students and to say, do the results that we've received on these standardized assessments match up to what we've been looking at and analyzing throughout the course of the year on the district assessments. And when there are discrepancies, those are the times that we really need to dig very deeply into that and try to figure out what those discrepancies might mean. So right now we have two annual state tests that we give to our students. It's the Smarter Balanced Assessment which assesses students in English language arts literacy and mathematics. It's an assessment that's administered to students in grades three through eight and 11. We also have our Connecticut Mastery Test, our Connecticut Academic Performance Test in science, and that is administered to students in grades five, eight, and 10. We have two Connecticut alternative assessments. We have a Connecticut alternate alternate assessment, and that is available to students with significant cognitive disabilities in grades three through eight and 11. And then we also have available to students, once again, with significant cognitive disabilities, um, a science checklist that we can give to students in grades five, eight, and 10. So I'm gonna begin with one test that I think is familiar to all of you, and that's the CMT. Right now, we give our, the CMT to students in grades five and eight during the month of March. It's a paper pencil assessment. It is not adaptive. Students receive scores in three different strand areas, science content and scientific inquiry. They also receive one overall um, score that places them in a performance level, and there are five performance levels from be below basic to the highest of advance, and that's level five. This is our grade five summary results. Um, we did uh, exceptionally well. 86.9% uh, of our students were at or above goal in fifth grade, and 90.1% of our students were at or above goal in grade eight. Our females outperformed our males slightly, um, but we really didn't feel that there was a statistical significance to those results. But it is something we continue to watch closely. Here's a chart of our comparison in the DERG. Um, as you can see from the chart, our fifth and eighth graders performed well, and we're certainly at the top of the DERG. The CAP is given to students in grades 10 during the month of March. Once again, it is a paper pencil assessment um, and it's not adaptive. There are five strands um, that the students are, will receive scores in, as well as science content and scientific inquiry. They too receive one overall score that places them in a performance level. Our 10th graders also performed quite well. They uh, were 87.1% of the students were at or above goal. In this case, 88% of the males were at or above goal and 85% of the females, males were outperforming the women slightly. Once again, not too much of a statistical significance. Uh, this is a comparison to the DERG of the students at or above goal. Mm -hmm. I was able to pull three years worth of data so that you could see uh, the scores over time. Once again, that's really not a way in which we look at data because we are looking at different groups of students who are taking the assessment. We tend to dive more deeply into those strands and how students perform on those strands. That gives us better information. Um, and, but we do look at vertical scores. We might look at the vertical scores a student gets in fifth grade and then what they get in eighth grade and then what they get in 10th grade. So we're looking at that growth over time. Um, but this was kind of important for us because it's really shown some nice steady growth um, with our students in 10th grade. And we're pretty proud of our results. We're number one in the DERG, and we're also number one in the state. So it's a lot for us to be proud of our, our science scores. Um, and certainly, Mr. Dun Duncan can answer any questions that you might have specifically about those later. I'm then gonna move into the Smarter Balanced Assessment. 
Um, the Smarter Balance Assessment has two method, methods of assessing students. There's a computer adaptive part of the test and there's performance tasks. The computer adaptive part will adjust the level of questions that the children will get throughout the test. Um, it tends to take the children to the highest level of a grade. It might take the children slightly out of the grade level, but not too much out of a grade level. And it might take the children slightly below the grade level, but once again, not too much out of that grade level. Um, the computer adaptive portion is a variety of test items. It has multiple choice, write-in responses, and then there's a lot of click and drag that they'll be doing. It's all computer-based. Um, once again, you can imagine that that computer adaptive portion is going to be mostly those multiple choice kinds of questions. Um, they're not responding and making adjustments based on, on those write-in responses. The performance tasks are designed to have students read much more complex tests, often informational tests, and learning about history, science, or health. Um, then they're asked to write about them, and usually the students have a certain purpose. They are thinking about a problem, they're analyzing what happened, and they're considering possible solutions for that problem. Um, in order to prepare the students for a performance task, oftentimes they'll begin about three days prior with just a classroom activity. Um, and this is really just to give everybody the same understanding of a topic that they might be um, engaged in during the performance task. And they want the children to just have some prior knowledge um, before going in and taking the performance task. Then in the actual test session, and once again, this is all computer based, they're actually reading three different sources. So they might be reading a story, they might be reading an article, they might be looking at charts and graphs or maps and tables. Um, and then it's followed by a series of questions. And typically those questions tend to be multiple choice, although there's a few brief right answers as well. And then they move into the real performance task. And that's gonna really include a writing portion in which the students are going to be required to use the source material and respond to a prompt. Um, and the prompt is either gonna be yielding a narrative answer, an informational answer, an opinion, or argumentative. Um, and the students really need to determine what's relevant in the sources that they've read, and they must use those sources to support their responses. And then the students are actually gonna be scored on organization, purpose, use of details, elaboration, as well as conventions. And in a moment, I'm gonna show you a couple examples to show you the difference between how they used to look at the CMT writing prompt and how a performance task might look for them. So in the area of English language arts, there are four areas of knowledge and skills, and sometimes you'll hear those referred to as claims, and these are measured on the ELA portion of the test. And the students will show they can read and understand a variety of complex, grade appropriate informational and literary texts. They use evidence from source materials to support their ideas and written responses at every grade level. They interpret and use information delivered orally to determine main ideas, summarize, or analyze. And they research a topic to, using the findings to take a position and defend it or to evaluate information. So here's an example of what the CMT used to like, look like for grade seven. Um, and here's this, you can see that they were given a prompt and they were asked to write to this prompt and they had about 45 minutes to write to the prompt. The answer is somewhat subjective, um, but yet the students really got to see, show their kind of creative thinking skills, which are very important. Um, but they really didn't have to analyze a problem and develop a solution or really write a conclusion. Um, the writing prompt um, did not include any source material. So this was what they were given, they were told what they needed to write to, and they had to respond within that 45 minutes. They didn't have to state a position, they didn't have to support their position. What they did have to do was use details and elaboration, um, but their answers were not scored for convention. So they were not scored for grammar, punctuation, or spelling. Now you can take a look at an example from the Smarter Balanced Assessment for grade seven. So in this example, you will see how much deeper students need to go to read, comprehend, and write a response. 
So they're given three different kinds of sources, and then they're going to have to make a claim, they're going to have to do counter arguments, they're going to have to support that claim with evidence from sources that they've read, they have to develop their ideas clearly, they have to use their own words. Um, so you can see that the writing prompts between the two assessments are quite different. The children really have to show um, that they have research and writing skills. They have the ability to analyze, compare, and think critically about problems and solutions. And they happen to be scored on their conventions. So conventions count. So what they've done with the Smarter Balance is they've taken away that time component. So with the CMT, the children were given that 45 minutes. At the end of the 45 minutes, it was over, and the writing prompts were collected. Here, the children are given untimed. So that means that they have the time to go back and correct for conventions and grammar and spelling. Um, and so that is a piece. So they're looking for the kids to not only develop this, but then to really spend some time going back and editing for that as well. In mathematics, there's four areas of knowledge and skills measured, or four claims as well. Um, and once again, these are students are going to explain and use mathematics to solve problems. They're going to complete math problems quickly and accurately. They're going to understand how math concepts link together. They're going to apply their mathematical knowledge to solve real world problems. And they're going to communicate their mathematical reasoning. And here's an example from the CMT grade five math. And the question is, which is true? And it's a multiple choice question. So you can see that the students might guess, might get the right answer. Um, they might actually write it out and solve it. But it's a multiple choice, and it's really not um, you know, giving us a real understanding of whether they're able to actually solve this problem. Mm -hmm. So here's an example of what grade five smarter balanced assessment might look like for, for students. So when you're comparing this item to the previous item, you'll see that the students really must um, apply what they know about fractions. Um, there's no guesswork. They have, once again, unlimited amounts of time, so they could take their time to solve this problem, and they must choose that best answer. Um, and they really are going to need to understand how to multiply fractions, which actually was not even tested in the fifth grade CMT. So you can see that um, the content knowledge that they need to understand and be able to apply is, is a little bit more rigorous. So the scoring is the students will receive a vertical score. Vertical scores is a way for us to measure growth over time. The results that we have this year are really baseline assessment. Um, they give us the vertical scores in the thousands, and they span all grades from 3 to 11. And the scores will fall between a level 1 and a level 4. So the levels are very different than the CMT. Um, one being the lowest and four being the highest. And this is just giving you an example in mathematics of, of what the spans might be when a parent receives a report on their child of what those vertical scores might look like. So when you're looking at the scoring, the way that they've interpreted this, you saw in the CMT they used to call it below basic, basic, proficient, goal, advanced goal. Um, now they call them level one, it does not meet the achievement level, two, approaching the achievement level expected, three, meets the achievement level expected, and four, exceeds the achievement level expected. And it's really important that there is no relationship or correlation to the CMT capped. So we have had many conversations with parents and have tried to explain the differences to parents, mainly in middle school, because they've had their children have the CMTs as third and fourth graders, some as fifth graders. So it's really having those in-depth conversations and getting them to see the differences between the two standardized assessments that were delivered. So remember in science, we talked about how they also received scores in all those different sub areas. So it's similar in the area of reading and similar in the area of math. So they will also receive performance indicators in the four different claims in ELA and the four different claims in math. Um, and they will receive it at 
or above standard at or near standard, below standard. Um, and you have to remember that when the parents are getting these scores, they do have a plus or minus because on any given day, the test might be slightly different for them based on the questions that they get right or the questions that they get wrong because it's got an adaptive nature to it. So they might have a differential of 25 points, plus or minus on any given day. The score might be 25 points higher or 25 points lower. Um, these are just sample reports um, that are sent to the parents. The parents and the families have all received paper reports. Um, there's also an online reporting system that's very similar to the CMT and CAPT online system. Um, it's managed by the Connecticut State Department of Education and teachers and administrators have access to that. But at this time, all the reports that are going to parents are still in paper um, and they have been uh, mailed to the parents. So let's take a look at our results. Um, once again, this chart demonstrates our baseline results in English language arts. It shows the percentage of student at each level, and the last column represents the percentage of students at or above at level three. So those are the people that are meeting or exceeding that achievement level. Um, what's really promising about this information is the percent of students at level four. Um, so we are pleased to see that we have a high percentage of our students who are exceeding the achievement level. That's great. That's terrific. It's always good to put it in comparison um, to the DERG so that you get an understanding of, of where New Canaan fell in relationship to the DERG. Um, our third graders performed first in the DERG. Um, while our fourth and fifth graders were ranked second in the DERG. Um, when we really looked at the claims of the scores um, at, that were reported to us, what we've noticed was that they seemed to be stronger in the areas of reading, writing, and research. And the scores that they were the lowest in was listening. Um, and if you, <laughs> if the listening test is very traditional in the sense that um, there is just a still picture that is on the screen. It might be a speech, it might be an article that's being read to them, and the kids are truly just listening. There is no visual stimuli um, going on. There is no words that are coming up on the screen. Um, so it's really going back to what are the key important ideas that this person is saying in their speech or in the article that they're reading, um, and they have to decipher all of that. So if you think of how our kids learn, oftentimes they do have the book in front of them, they're highlighting information, even if they're reading on the computer, they're highlighting information, or they might be watching a video and, and responding to it. So it's just something different that we have to begin to um, think about how we might address our students in that regard. And I guess if you think about college and career ready, um, and really what this test is pushing kids to do, um, you might be sitting in a, a college course where you hear a lecture, or you might be sitting um, in a work where you have to participate in a meeting and listen very carefully to the other's ideas and respond and think about those. So that's where I think they've come up with this listening portion of the test. Um, I did want to pull out our 11th graders because the and we can compare them to the DERG as well um, because Easton and Reading becomes region 9 so we wanted to perform that. I think it was really hard though to compare this data um, with the DERG and I, the reason I think it's so hard to do so is because you have to draw your eyes over to the participation rate. So we were the highest participation rate um, with 97.4% of our students um, at New Canaan High School taking the test. And I do really congratulate the administrative team um, for how they went about working through a schedule um, and having the children um, come into the computer lab and take the assessment during their reading block of time or their math block of time. So I really give a lot of credit to the department chairs and the administrators because I think it was just a natural part of the kids' day. They just showed up at the lab um, and they took that assessment um, and real a, a special thanks to Mr. Sullivan because I know that he worked really hard on making sure that he would track students down and have them take finish the assessment and, and do lots of makeup assessments with the kids and it was a very busy time of year um, because when we assess 11th graders um, 
we have to be close to 80% of the year in completion. Um, so you're talking April, late April, after April break. Um, so for our children to show up and participate and take the assessment um, is speaking about our children as well and certainly about the parents who supported this. So we thank all of you. Um, and really the next closest district was Wilton with 93.7 participation. So when you start to take that all into consideration, um, I'd like to think our students did well. When you compare us out to the state results, um, we were right up in, in the top three. Um, and those would be with districts that were about the same with our participation rate. When we look at the math results here, um, this demonstrates, once again, our baseline results in math. It shows the percentage of students at each level, and the last column represents the percentage of students at or above at level three. Um, once again, we had a higher percentage of students at level four, which exceeds that achievement level, um, and that was really apparent in pretty much all of the grade levels as you're scrolling down. Once again, it's important to put this in comparison to the DERG. Um, certainly when you look at the math scores, they're not as high as they normally are. Um, but when you put it into relationship with the DER, um, we performed right where um, everybody else was in, in the performance of math. Across the state, the results in math were slightly lower. Um, but we're proud. Our fourth and fifth graders were first in the DERG, and our fifth graders um, were first in the state. So um, they performed exceptionally well, and our eighth graders were second in the DERG. Um, once again, when we looked at these claims, we noticed strengths in problem solving, communication, reasoning, and modeling and data analysis. And those seem to be the highest um, on how our students performed. Um, once again, it was hard to compare our 11th grade data with a DERG because of those participation rates. Um, once again, we had the highest participation rate in mathematics with 97.4% of our children participating. Um, and Wilton was the closest with 94.6%. Um, and I have to say that with the 68.7%, I believe that was, I want to say like second in the state, second or third in the state. Mm -hmm. So in summary, as before we move into Bill's presentation, um, you know, we really spent a lot of time looking at the data. Um, we spent time with the entire curriculum leaders who really spent time analyzing and sharing their findings. And it was really unique because we came together as a, an administrative team. So all the administrators as well as the curriculum leaders um, came together for a session after school where the curriculum leaders um, had spent time doing some analysis and shared their findings. And it was really um, a great session where administrators were able to ask them and, and it was a, a back and forth um, discussion and dialogue and, and very helpful to all of us. Um, we continue to look for surprises once again, um, trying to analyze, you know, how did our uh, females perform to males. In some cases, it's very traditional in the sense that you'd look at some of the ELA data and you'd say that the females were outperforming the males. You'd look at some of the math data, see the math, the males were outperforming the females. Once again, this is kind of our baseline, our first year giving this, so we want to look at this over time and always bring it back to our district assessments. Um, we've also mailed all of those parent reports, and I know that there have been many individual conferences that have happened at the building level, um, thanks to all the department chairs, as well as all the curriculum coordinators and administrators who have really been fielding all of those phone calls. Um, and it's so nice to have curriculum leaders who really know students well and really can look at data and have conversations with parents that are very meaningful and help to put everything into perspective about the results that they may have received. Um, and then the final bullet here is really um, kind of the elephant in the room, I guess, but um, the grade 11 students are no longer going to be taking the Smarter Balanced Assessment. Um, and in the spring, they're gonna be required to take the SAT as their annual state assessment. Um, and I do have to say that I look on the state website daily, or maybe not daily, but close to daily. Um, and I know that um, I'm 
ask Brian if he's received anything from the commissioner about what does this mean for our 11th graders, and I don't have any answers um, about what this really means, um, what the accommodations will mean for students with special needs, what the accommodations for students with English language learners, um, when they will have to take the SAT. So we are still awaiting the questions. Um, we've been keeping all of the questions that parents have been sending into the high school administration, um, hoping to get the answers, and as soon as we have more information about it, um, we will set up an informational session for the parents, and I'll be happy to come back to the board um, and share um, the information that we have. So at this time, we're going to move into Mr. Egan, who's going to pick up with SATs, um, and then we'll be able to answer questions. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely have to raise it a little bit too. Oops, I just unplugged it. It's for moving it. <laughs> it's totally gonna fall. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I just want to say I consider it an honor and a privilege to to be here. Um, Dr. Crenti was talking a little bit before about the parents and then the emails and phone calls that we received about the SAT. Truly, it's, it's such a, a community that's so invested in education, and it's evident in the data that you're going to see tonight as well, but they're kind and, and, and caring kids and uh, really a family and community that cares so much and invested about education, and you have a wonderful staff as well that's truly invested in making sure their education is wonderful at all times. So anyway, we'll start off with the SATs. Um, up here, you'll see a, a comparison with the DERG. Uh, we do fairly well in our, well, we do well in our SATs. Uh, critical reading, we came up in fifth uh, with 582. You'll see a trend over time, fairly consistent. Math, we ended up with 609, and writing, which was second in the DERG, and writing also second in the DERG at 594. The SA2 tests are specific subject tests that uh, students take. Um, it's a limited number of students, but our kids do very well uh, in compared to a national mean. When they can look at the mean scores there, we do generally well across the board. And these are a select number of students who, do the, who take that test. In the next page, you'll see a comparison of our students over time from 2011 to 2015. A little slightly different information in the sense of looking at trends when you look at males versus females. In 2015, our males uh, really outpaced our, our females in reading as well as math. Uh, that's not historical. It's not something uh, that's a trend over time necessarily. Uh, but last year, that was indeed the case. On the next slide, you'll see an ACT trend. Uh, I want to include ACTs because with the SAT changing, the ACT is becoming a little bit more prevalent in all schools. And you'll see that uh, here at New Canaan High School. But also, I think you'll see that number jump up even more this year. For the last five years, you'll see a trend there. And I, I included the benchmark score and what that means. Basically, if you uh, exceeded the benchmark score, it means that you'll have a chance, a 50% chance of getting a B on a college level course and a 75% chance of getting a C on a college level course. You can take a look at the subject areas that are tested there. English is pretty incredible. 97% of our students who took that test uh, exceeded the benchmark score and outpaced the state average in that as well. And in every area, we outpaced the state average. Math, we were at 82% last year. Uh, reading also at 82%. And science, it dipped a little bit, but again, much better than the state average at 73%. You could see historically over time, we do better than the state average as well. But again, this is a limited sample size and not our entire school. Also, if you look over the five-year period, the next page, you'll see um, our students' average scores. Once again, we outpace the state average. That's what the top column is. You'll see us outpacing the state average in every category. And then the national average is below that as well, so we're significantly above the national <coughs> average on the ACT. <coughs> Excuse me. 
This next area we could really point to some, some particular growth and something to really be proud of as a high school uh, is our advanced placement participation. Over the last five years, we've significantly enhanced the number of courses that are offered at the high school. We've gone from 18 courses up to 26 this year, including two online courses. Uh, and then there's an asterisk down there because one course right now is still an English 3 honors course that has not uh, transferred over to an AP course, but half the students in last year's group took the test, and this year it's anticipated that more students will even take it. Uh, you can take a look at the total enrollment uh, for grades 10 through 12 and the total enrollment in AP classes. And then also the total number of tests taken. This is, you'll see the next slide as well. This has really uh, been increased over the past really seven years, but over the last five years it's increased by, looks like about 300 students taking AP tests. That's a pretty significant increase. And then you can take a look at the, the different students, the number of different students that are taking AP tests as well. That's also increasing. And you can take a look there as well, the percentage of, who are enrolled in AP tests who tested, meaning that most of our students take the test if they're enrolled in the courses. Here are the courses that are offered. Uh, the courses that are asterisks are, are being taken on virtual high school this year by a couple of students. And again, I talked a little about the English 3 Honors course where a significant number of students are taking the test. If you look a little bit historically over the next slide, you could tell in 2007, we, we really didn't have a school with many students taking AP tests. It was only for a, a certain number of students. Back at that, in that uh, time, we had 32% of our students taking tests. That's increased just about each and every year with the exception of one little blip one year. And to where this year, there's about 67% of our students enrolled in AP courses. And the percentage of students earning three or better has been climbing just about every year as well. Last year, there was the most significant leap up to 54.5% of the senior class uh, taking and passing it means earning a three or better on an AP test. Now, the percentage of students still taking tests, getting a three or better, that's pretty much most of our kids. Last year, it was 94% of the students taking an AP test um, scored a three or better as well. You would think that number would drop by going up about 500 students over, over that course of uh, time period, but it has not. The students continually take these tests, do very, very well at our school. On the next page, you can see the courses that we offer and how we do over time. Um, you'll see areas of great growth and some with a little bit of stagnant growth, uh, which might include some potential for, for some increased growth as well. You'll see the English Lang and Lang Comp course is, is really the English 3 Honors course. It's not an AP course. However, 49 students out of the English 3 Honors course and some students out of American Studies decided last year to take the test. Out of those 49 students, 96% of them earned a three or better. This year, the total enrollment in English 3 Honors is 92 students, so we we'll hope to see that uh, increase pretty significantly. Again, we, have, we should be really proud of how our kids do on these tests. If you look at math, 100% of our students uh, get a three or better on the test that they take. However, that might indicate an opportunity for some increased growth as well. And again, we do very well in all areas. Science, we do very well. I'll note that last year, I think, was the first year that Physics 1 became an AP course or our Honest Physics course. So 69 students enrolled in that course, 87% of them got a three or better. This year, there are 72 students enrolled in that course. We've really had tremendous growth in social studies. Uh, there are many new courses that have been offered, and our kids do generally very, very well in all these courses. Uh, the one course that's only two years old, it's shown some improvement over the last two years and will continue to grow. The other courses that we've added, uh, macro and microeconomics, are also an ECE course, uh, and our students do well in there as well. Uh, you'll notice a little bit if you look at world history, there was some changing in, in how the testing happened, and we'll see some increase in time in that section as well. It dipped a little bit last year uh, to this year, but the enrollment will pop back up. And you'll see our foreign language and music theory and art courses as well. Basically, this is our, our class breakdown of the class of 2016. The students have taken one or more AP courses. There's 192 students, which accounts for 67% of that class. Mm -hmm. Haven't taken one or more courses, but no AP courses. There's 23 students, that's 8%. So the total having taken AP or honors is about 75% of our class. That's 
On the next page, you'll see the AP Scholar information. I gave you a little breakdown of what that means. But basically, to be an AP Scholar, you need a three or higher on three or more exams. I won't read through all of those sections, but the, the one that's pretty amazing to me is the National AP Scholar. There are, it's a four average on all exams, uh, a four or more on all of them, and you have to take eight exams. So students are taking eight exams. That's 18 students. It's a pretty significant increase over, over what was done previously. I think it was uh, nine the previous year and six before that. That's a tremendous workload for, for those students to be able to do that and do that well. Other college options, because it's not just all about AP. We, we offer other college options as well. Uh, NCC has courses in anatomy and physiology and TV broadcasting. We offer UConn courses, or ECE courses, in micro and macroeconomics, human development and family, and Spanish five honors. And through UNH, we have our Project Lead the Way courses of computer science, digital electronics, and intro into engineering. Not on the list of AP courses, but we believe those kids in computer science this year will be AP computer science ready to take the test. So we'll see as we get close to the AP exam, but our hope is that those kids will also take an AP exam in AP computer science. Basically, 75% of all grade 12 students have taken at least one college level class. This includes Project Lead the Way, UConn, NCC, and AP designated courses. And just a brief uh, summary on, on some of what the department will do, and I won't read through all this because you can take a look at that. But certainly we want to be knowledgeable about the new S SAT that's coming out. We want to review and evaluate our AP offerings and see if there are other new college courses that we can add to our, our repertoire of courses. And we want to take a look at what we currently offer and say, can we uh, push more kids or challenge more kids uh, who, who would be AP ready? And again, we want to diagnose any, any curricular adjustments necessary for the new SAT. And we want to expand opportunity for all students to have success in college courses. We'll take a look at ECE. Uh, in Norwalk Community College and virtual high school as well. So, thank you. At this point, I think Dr. Parenti is ready for any of your questions. Just call them up one by one. And I did have a challenge. I, I, pretty much at every meeting I've been at, they said, you know, the over under for me saying I'm new here was four, and I don't think I did it until then just once. So, I'm, I'm doing all right. So, anyway, any questions? Anybody want to start? I, I want to start on that. I so, I can I just start and say wow, and then uh, from there on it, we'll get to the details. That's really remarkable. Everything that you've been doing. Anybody want to start with some things that they had particular? Yes, Penny. I just uh, <clears throat> want to uh, commend the work uh, that's been done with respect to the AP classes. I remember sitting on this board about seven years ago, and teachers saying well, we don't know what's going to happen when a lot more students take. AP exam, but let's try it and let's see what happens. And the results are just so apparent across the subject matters. And uh, I think that's a uh, number of teachers have learned how to teach all these new classes really well, and the students are obviously motivated. So uh, I just uh, I commend everybody for all their efforts on that behalf. Uh, I guess one of the questions I had is with respect to some of the scores, like the SAT subject tests. Um, can we compare those to how our, our students do versus the DERG and, as well, instead of the national mean? Uh, it'll no. probably take a little bit data. This is readily available for me. Uh, but uh, I probably could find out that information. I just have that because it's readily available. And it's also such a small sample size, but I could probably find that information for you. Okay. I was just um, uh, cur curious about that. Um, and then one of the questions I had is a little bit off topic, but uh, in terms of the state requiring the uh, SAT for 11th graders, how does that work with how college uh, juniors report or seniors report their scores to uh, colleges? I, I remember when my sons had to report the scores, if you reported, I thought, I, I was recalling that if you reported like one SAT subject test, everything got reported. Uh, that all your scores went and you couldn't select out. And so I was, you know, I know that some students decide to take the ACT <coughs> rather than the SAT. Uh, I thought some students, so well, I was, I guess my understanding of them, if the student took the ACT and took an SAT subject test and those were the scores that they wanted to report to colleges, 
uh, are they also going to end up having to have to report the SAT that's now mandated? Because that. Oh, the one thing I can say is I did talk to uh, Alan Bernstein from College Board the other day. Sorry, and uh, the one thing he talked about was we don't really have all the answers yet. They haven't come out with that. However, what schools school, schools really want are the students' best scores, and that's really all they want to see. Um, so, honestly, he said, if you, even if a parent or anyone called and said, ask the school, they just want to know what the best mm -hmm. scores are. Uh, but he did well, not have an answer about whether or not they'd be reported yet. Okay. Well, I would just, because the test is now mandated. Yes. So it's taking away the flexibility of New Canaan High School students to decide really whether or not they want to take the act or the SAT. Uh, I would just suggest that we continue to work and uh, press with the college board on what we think is a kind of favorable outcome on that and, and give our students the most flexibility possible. Yeah. Uh, the students will have the flexibility to still take the tests that they would like to take. I think what we have to remember is that we will have to offer the SAT on school premises. The students will have to participate. That will be part of our participation rate. Um, all the details, though, is still what we're waiting for from the State Department of Education. So where does this fit? Um, how does it all get reported out? Many of the questions that parents have sent in are um, asking the same question that you're asking. Um, and we're still just awaiting for all of the answers um, from the State Department of Ed and what that will all mean. Um, my understanding from the State Department of Ed, too, was that the kids still would be able to super score um, and send off those highest scores to the universities that they're um, looking to apply to. Okay, right. and well, and also, I mean, one of the, I don't know whether or not anybody's discussed with the state the possibility, they're both great tests, the mm -hmm. ACT and the SAT, so I don't know whether or not it'd be possible for the state to say that an 11th grader could take either test. I think at this time, the State Board of Ed has um, accepted the SAT as the nationally recognized assessment that the juniors will be taking. So I know that when it was given to the federal government for the waiver, it was just stated as a nationally recognized assessment. Um, and then it has come clear um, through the voting of the State Board of Ed that it will be the SAT mm. as the state recognized test. That doesn't mean that <coughs> kids cannot, they still can take the ACT. Um, they still can take all the subject assessments. It just means that as part of the state assessment, they're going to be required to take the SAT. Right. And so this is a decision that was made towards the end of the summer. And the state is still, they're still meeting and discussing both the State Board of Ed, the governor has been involved with this, um, and of course the Commissioner of Education and others as they, with the SAT and with this test. Um, I will say, and I want to commend uh, Ms. Rivera for this, uh, recognizing what was happening as far as the SAT and the ACT and other things, we are uh, starting this year an ACT testing center where in the past our students had to go to another school system in order to take the ACT. Mm -hmm. We're now going to offer it here in New Canaan, mm -hmm. I think twice? Twice throughout the course of the year. Um, because we also, mm -hmm. we want to provide those services to our families as best we can. Um, but this, it's much of the reason why Dr. Crenty is um, regularly checking the State Department of Ed website. Uh, we've ha both had conversations with folks on the, on the State Board of Ed and who are working for the state around this. And it's just a matter of getting answers to those, some of those questions, which are important questions to have those responses to. But what, what we don't want to do is try to sort of guess, right, and say we think this or we think that, uh, because it's, it's an important thing for all of our mm -hmm. kids that are involved. So we are pressing the state to give us some of these answers. For them, their structure is between the governor, the commissioner, and the State Board of Education, and trying to figure out how this will all work. Um, but it was it was a relatively late announcement, even in the summer. It was towards middle middle of August, essentially, that we became aware of this. And I will say, um, you know, Bill mentioned our parent community and their involvement. Uh, when this came out and, and the press release came out and people learned about it, uh, some of the high school parents got together and wrote a long email to Mr. Egan with questions, uh, which he forwarded to me. I sent that on to the state to say, these are some of the questions we need answered. And, uh, and they wrote back and said, thank you, this helps, and we're waiting for those answers. So. <laughs> Deanna. Um, two things. One, 
one I wanted to commend, um, you know, Mr. Egan and um, Ms. Rivera and everybody, um, having a, a 11th grader this year and having to live through sort of the um, lovely transitions that we all get to, to experience this year. Um, I think you've done an excellent job um, communicating with parents and, and making people aware of, of the changes early and often and, and being very responsive. So I appreciate that, um, and I'm sure many of the parents in the, in the community do as well. Um, I think it's important to uh, also um, maybe respond to your comment about the SAT, ACT, and please correct me if anything I say is incorrect, but the new SAT, as I understand it, is aligned with the new curriculum, and that's why they're not allowing the ACT or the old um, SAT to be um, the test of choice because really the CMT and all the other tests were supposed to be aligned to what the kids were, you know, it's, it's a way of testing what, what they've learned in school. So th I think that's the reason they allowed the um, 11th graders to use the SAT as a, as a test. So mm -hmm. if that's... The mm -hmm. only, the very small thing I would just say mm -hmm. is it's aligned to the new standards, right? Yes, right? And then we develop yes. our curriculum yes, from those sorry. standards. Yes, no, okay. yes, sorry. Uh, but yes, that al and that alignment is very important. Right. And mm -hmm. so, you know, and, 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 you know, I think the one thing we all have to be um, cognizant of in, in this process is while we're very fortunate in this community to have um, parents and, and um, you know, who are able to provide lots of um, test prep and all kinds of great things to help our own children do well. Um, I think the, the purpose of um, making the SAT more aligned with the standards is that so those kids in communities that can't afford to provide what our community can, um, can also have the opportunity to do well on those tests. So, um, you know, I think we all have to kind of step outside of our own sort of, you know, testing mania here and um, <laughs> and think about that. So anyway, that's my. I wanted to go. I wanted just to go back on something to build upon my compliment, which was very brief to say the least. But I was very pleased to see having gone through the uh, all of the preparation for the Smarter Balance and the way that you again anticipated parents' questions, had workshops, helped them to understand and then also to have uh, help during afterward so that they would be able to understand what they were getting back as far as their reports. And then to see how nice it is that our curriculum aligns with it also. And I know that's taken a lot of work to make sure that that goes on. And I'm very pleased about that when I think about that book, The Smartest Kids in the World, that we're trying to uh, have the idea be that it's more of a thinking process so that as you do well on these tests, it means the kids are thinking more. So that's a wonderful caveat, a wonderful way to be able to say for you, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Other comments? Sangita. Yeah. I just said, because um, the other question along when you're asking these questions, getting answers from the um, college <laughs> boards is just where the, the data is going to be kept or who controls it. Because when we had the CMTs, you know, it was the database was with the schools. The colleges didn't find out what was happening with you know what, how they scored in these. When it's an SAT, it's a national test. Is the college board the one that's holding it, and then it is part of your college profile, or is it you know these are special tests that is just for us um, as an assessment, and so they're housed really with our school. So again, I know that you probably don't know yet, but something to. Right. And, and we don't we don't yeah. know, yeah. Uh, and it is one yeah, of the yeah, questions right. that we're asking. But I do want to say the uh, even with the CMT and the CAPT of the past, those those were housed in the uh, CT reports, the state's database, mm -hmm. right? So it was a state assessment, and the data, the results were housed in the state database, um, not just locally in the school. Uh, this is although it's a national test, it is this it does meet the requirement as mm -hmm. the, as the state assessment which is what under No Child Left Behind and other laws we have to give the Educational, Elementary Secondary Education mm -hmm. Act. Um, the, but since it's still the state test, that's part of the question mm -hmm. around where do those results go? Right. You know, and, and what are they used for? So we're working on it. Great. Sure. And we did try to put the presentation as late as we could in October in hopes that we would have these answers. So I feel <laughs> horrible saying I don't know to many of those questions. And I know Dr. Lutze and, and Mr. Egan and the other high school staff feel the same way. So we did try to wait, um, but we didn't want to hold off um, any longer with giving out the other results and how our students perform. So when we do have the answers, we will come forward. Um, we also have many of our high school staff who are actually going through 
some workshops now. So as they learn more about the SAT, we will offer parent workshops as well. And I, I would like to say that, um, again, kind of following what Penny was saying, that um, the tremendous growth that we've had, you know, because there have been questions about, you know, access to the AP courses and kids taking them. And if you see the numbers show that, you know, from the last year, there's a tremendous growth. And so that's really uh, fabulous because I know those are concerns parents had of how do I get my kids there. <laughs> and I, you know, um, commend the, the faculty, administration, everyone to be able to open those doors and, you know, allow children to, various ways to get in and take that if they wanted to mm -hmm. take them. Sherry. Um, first, just to continue the thought on the AP, and it's a commendable goal that we've now achieved 75% of our students having taken the AP or honors class. And now we're almost to the point where we say, what is the goal? Because I know in some, some of the ninth grade transition meetings, we had a lot of hyper parents concerned about getting their kids out taking APs early. And so um, I guess one question is just, do we have a goal? And, and or how do we frame that discussion to make sure that all students aren't feeling pressure um, to perhaps be taking courses that they're not ready or prepared for. Sure. <laughs> we have, do have a board goal that's, that talks about all students taking a college level course, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> the, um, ultimately our goal is for every student prior to graduation to have a college level opportunity. Right. That does not mean AP. Because no. our goal certainly is not to try to sort of channel everybody on the same path. I think one of the things we, we're very proud of as a school system is the multiple pathways that students can take to success, you know, based on that mm -hmm. student and his or her strengths. Um, but part of the our goal has been to broaden the catalog so that there are more opportunities, both in AP, but also through the Early College <coughs> Experience Program, the NCC Program, some of the other programs that are available, our Project Lead the Way program, things like that. Uh, so we're continuing to look at ways to expand that program. Even a few department chairs are, think, are talking about working on a couple of courses now. And I think I heard that just today or <laughs> yesterday. Uh, so we're continuing to expand the program and look at those ways that students can get involved. I think we... Um, would do a disservice to our students and families if we said all students must take an AP course you know, because that mm -hmm. they're taught in a certain way and, and it's uh, it works for many students but it's more about college level coursework mm -hmm. opportunities for our students and ultimately in, a, in our school where the majority of our students do go on to four-year college and do, do well uh, if we can provide enough opportunities for them to have that experience I believe that we can hit that hit that goal and have every student with an, op an experience at a college level, whether it be in a heavily academic area or maybe in, in an elective area or other things like that. Um, so that's what we're working towards. But it is still about diversifying the program. Right. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Okay. And just going back to the Smarter Balance, I also want to commend the transition um, to the Smarter Balance, which also had a big technology component that we haven't really talked about. Um, I have t two questions on the Smarter Balance. One is, I know that some students perceive this as kind of a transition year um, with a new type of a, a new test. And how do we always encourage our students, you know, with the best performance on these tests as they really guide um, our instruction? And then the, then the second question is, um, based on these results, have we been able to analyze and identify any gaps in the curriculum, being that the these are aligned with new standards. Um, have we been able to go back then and, and tie that back into our curriculum? Um, um. I, I can certainly respond, and I can also call a few of the coordinators up to respond as well. But certainly, mm -hmm. one of the things that we're working on is performance based assessments. Um, and we're adding those in with our district curriculum. So I think oftentimes when our children took the CMT, they would end the CMT and they'd look at their teacher and they'd say, oh, I don't think we had any math application problems on it. <laughs> Um, and the teacher would be like, oh, you had math application problems on it. Um, so we are preparing our kids to be able to look at um, three different sources. Right now I can speak of a, a fourth grade um, assessment that will be given to students and we're going to be integrating cross-disciplinary with the immigration unit as well as reading and writing and the kids are going to be required to look at three different sources, um, sources that they haven't seen before, um, articles, a graph and a chart, um, different <coughs> types of immigration. They'll be asked a series of questions and then they'll be actually doing a writing prompt to it. So it's a nice way for us to assess some of their content knowledge in social studies. It's also a way for us to assess their reading ability. Um, 
Um, are they able to comprehend the material at that grade level? And then also their writing. Um, and we did have many of our coordinators who also participated in the state assessment um, open briefs and writing scoring, so they're able to actually have a rubric that they'll be able to use um, and be able to score um, the children on, and then obviously we'll train teachers on that, and eventually we'll get you know children to have friendly rubrics. Um, do we think this is the right way to go? We do. I mean, this is really giving us a way of analyzing our students and, and requiring them to think deeply. Um, on Thursday, we have a math presentation for parents, and I know Zoe Robinson will be talking a little bit about some of the differences that we've seen in the math curriculum, particularly in fractions. That was a great example that I gave <coughs> with um, that we have fifth graders who are requiring to multiply fractions. So are we going back and looking at the standards and trying to identify where there might be gaps and, and how to figure out where those gaps are? Um, we are, but it's not based on the results of the Smarter Balanced Assessment. It's really good going back and looking at the standards, looking at our curriculum, and identifying from that perspective where we think gaps are. Um, the Smarter Balance was really just a baseline assessment. Um, and I have to say that we only received scores on those claims. Um, so it was one overall score. And then when you saw the results for the claims, it was really just saying they were at the standard, they were at or near the standard, they were below the standard. So it didn't really give us that much in-depth information. Um, and I think I go back to what I said earlier, that we really don't want to make changes based on a test. We really want our children to think deeply and analyze and um, material that's given to them. And so we don't teach to a test, we, we really teach to our curriculum and assess our curriculum. Can we build on your second question, the technology? That was something new, the way the test was given. How did that work out? Um, <laughs> well, after we um, realized that the iPads weren't going to work so well for our students, and we regrouped and got our laptops over um, to test 1,300 students at Sachs Middle School, which was wow. quite an amazing accomplishment. And kudos to the administrators and that leadership team for organizing all of those efforts. Um, and certainly, I think that we were most nervous about our third graders approaching the test on the computer. And I think we quickly realized that the adults were more nervous than the kids. Um, they learned how to use those embedded features within the assessment so much more quickly than we as adults. Um, they learned when they could hit to hear something, when they could underline something, when they could cut and paste and put things into a notes and then come back to it. Um, very similar to how our, our middle school and high school students um, took the assessment. However, with that said, we are um, putting a lot of our performance-based assessments, trying to get them onto the computer, because certainly reading on a computer and composing on a computer is, is certainly very different than just paper pencil. Mm -hmm. um, so it is trying to put some of those performance-based assessments, when developmentally appropriate, over to that computer and, and getting the children accustomed to taking some of those assessments. Um, we still use NWEA at the middle school, five through eight, which is all computer-based. Um, so we were feeling very comfortable with our <coughs> middle school students moving into that um, and taking that and being able to read on the computer. I think some of it is really that composing is on the computer, too, that we have to look through. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, yes, Deanna, then Sangeeta. I just, um, you know, we spoke last year about sort of how the um, SBAC testing being the first year, there tend to be a lot of, um, you know, uh, cha not changes to the test, but a lot of questions get thrown out and you realign sort of what you're asking and things like that as you sort of get, you, you perfect sort of the test. And I wanted to understand how much alignment, if you've had a chance to do this analysis yet, but how much alignment are you seeing between the, our kids' results on the SBAC and sort of how you, based on other assessments that they've done in the district, um, how they have performed. So are, are we seeing strong alignment between that testing and sort of where we thought they would test or are we seeing a lot of divergence based on a new test and, and you know? I think what's probably been most helpful is looking more individual scores versus overall performance. And I think that's been more telling for us. So it's been easier to go back and look more at 
um, the children that were at a level four, level three, level two, level one, and then kind of diving in more deeply and looking at those individual scores and then looking at those district assessments to say, you know, is this telling us new information mm -hmm. about this child? Once again, it's that triangulation of data, which we train our teachers to do now with district assessments and unit assessments and how are they triangulating that data to make sure that when they're giving, you know, a summative assessment, a midterm assessment or end of the year assessment, that it's it's really truly what the child's able to do. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's designing some more performance-based assessments um, for our students as well. Okay. Sangeeta. Um, <clears throat> again, I, I'm not sure if this is still early on, but just um, looking at this just the first time through, you know, I noticed that when and you go across the different grades, you know, the, the younger grades tend to be doing a significant bit better in achievement, you know, across the board compared to the, you know, upper grades. And I'm not sure if that's because the younger ones are more in tune with this new curriculum and understand this type of testing, haven't had the other tests, which is very different compared to the old ones, or if it's also some motivation, you know, the younger ones will do what you want and the older ones are, know that this is a practice <laughs> test and I don't have to do very well. So I'm not quite sure what it is about that, but I mean, or did you find that there's, you know, some discrepancy where we, we may be missing some things or losing something along the way? Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of factors that play into this right now. I think also we're talking about, you know, when you realign curriculum and you, you start in kindergarten and you work your way up with curriculum and, and so you have a group of third graders who have been um, exposed more to common core standards and it's been more embedded within our curriculum um, versus maybe an eighth grader who started a little bit later. So, you know, as, although we're identifying where gaps are and teaching to where those gaps are, you might see some discrepancies there. Um, I think we're always going back and looking at, um, you know, how students took the test individually. You know, did, mm -hmm. did some students write, um, you know, a lot? Did some kids just hit quickly, hit submit? Um, those anecdotal notes are, are very powerful as we go back and look at those. Um, so I think it's, it's going to be over time. Mm -hmm. um, I think really we just kind of keep going back, looking at our curriculum, looking at standards, making sure we're aligned, making sure that we have data teams that are analyzing data regularly. That's really important to us. Um, you know, I know that they'll look at unit assessments and how kids performed on unit assessments. They'll look at benchmark assessments. How do kids perform on benchmark assessments? But it is using that, you know, ongoing data to really help drive that instruction is, mm -hmm. is important. And then one other question, um, just because we talked about, you know, the college courses that are available, and I'm familiar with the Project Lead the Way at the high school, but I'm not so familiar with the, the, the Newark Community College and the UConn. Is that something where you bring the teachers here or, or that program here, or do the kids actually go out or they just do all that online, or how does that work? Our, our <laughs> Our teachers get trained uh, through through either whether it be UConn or NCC, and they teach the course. And depending on the, the, the place the final is given, it's the college final, and it's how well they do on the final is whether or not they receive the credit. Okay. And the, our faculty essentially are considered adjunct faculty at that university as they do that training. Um, they get their IDs and they get mm -hmm. the whole thing. So. And so then if a child, say, scores well and is able to get college credit, do then do they need to then apply to the University of UConn or, or NCC to get that credit or is it just put onto their transcript so the colleges can see that this child mm -hmm. actually took a college level course? How Correct. It, and it's also transferable. So many in many cases, they're transferable to another uh, institution they get, go into, usually as an elective credit. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's terrific. Thank you. Good questions? Yes, Allison. I know as you've all heard over and over again, there, there are parents that feel that the kids are over assessed. You know, they're constantly being tested. And I think some of that's just because of from parental experiences from previous generations, you know, the way it worked in the classroom was the teacher taught, then it was a matter of stop. Now we're going to, you know, hand this piece of paper out. We're going to assess, you know, where you are on this. Can you speak a little bit to how assessment and education are interwoven now? And, and I would like to hear, actually, if possible, from some of the leaders here, just anecdotally, uh, some of the examples of how they assess while they educate, kind of the simultaneous process of assessing while you're educating um, to quell maybe some parents' concerns about the fact that education stops and every time we're assessing, mm -hmm. our, our children are losing out rather than it's kind of a simultaneous mm -hmm. process. Sure. And it's not teaching. <laughs> <laughs> and it's no, not. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. <laughs> it's the least I could do for her. Um, you know, in third and fourth grade, and that's what I can speak to uh, as far as reading goes, um, our teachers use the workshop model, and they will do a mini lesson, and then children will be reading at their own independent level, and the teachers circulate and confer with their students and take notes, and they really find out just on this one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction exactly where their strengths and their weaknesses are. Um, the kids keep uh, lists of the books that they read and the, how many pages they read uh, every day, and teachers can look at their reading logs, and which is an assessment. They can say, oh, you know, this child just read for half an hour and read two pages, so perhaps they weren't paying attention the whole time. Um, so it's, it's just this constant conversation that they're having with them. They meet with small groups and um, discuss the books that they're reading and ask significant questions uh, to test comprehension. So, but it's a constant conversation. And so it's not feeling like a test so much. And if you walk into a room, there's, it's so busy. And you see kids talking about the books that they're reading with each other, with their teacher. And this culture is established in the classroom where there's just a constant give and take. Um, we're working with teachers tomorrow on looking at the interactive read aloud, where a teacher, and, and this is for kindergarten first and second grade, where a teacher will read a really provocative picture book, but give the kids a chance to stop and converse with each other um, and, and really get to the, the deeper meaning of that picture book at, while the teacher circulates and listens to their conversations. All of this is assessment. So I don't feel like our kids feel as if they are overassessed. And even with the DRA, which assesses reading, it's one on one with the teacher. So, you know, especially the little kids love it. You know, there they are with the teacher and they're reading to the teacher and talking with the teacher. Um, the other thing is that they assess how kids feel about reading. You know, what is their attitude about reading? So um, that's a big part of it too. And it goes on the rubric. You know, what's their. Um, how excited are they about reading? Can they talk about uh, the different books that they love, you know, their favorite author? Um, we have a question on our GRA that um, it's so funny because it says, what's your favorite book? And we found that kindergartners were not answering that question. They would just sit there. And it's because they couldn't choose their favorite. And they thought it had to be their very favorite. So now we phrase it a little bit differently. But we gather all this so we really have a good picture all around of what kids are like as readers because we want them all to love reading passionately. Um, I don't know, is that answering yeah, a little no, bit for, yes, for younger very kids? It helps paint a picture, which I think is helpful to parents, when it's, especially when it's a very different mm -hmm. environment than what they're familiar with. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. I mean, I, going into a reading class at the elementary schools, and I'm looking at the principals because they know, um, it's just the most exciting thing. And you hear these discussions that you can't believe are happening with such young children. They really are engaged all the time. It's exciting. It's a dynamic process. Can, so, I, anyway. can I build on that a question that sometimes parents will say is they've heard they're teaching to the test, and certainly what you're describing is not sounding as if there's a test that's being taught to. Is there, we, can you We honestly on couldn't that? teach to Smarter Balance because we had no idea. <laughs> and I was a complete wreck, and, and that's the truth. And I, I believed in our teachers, and I believed in our curriculum, which we worked so hard at to match with the Common Core standards. But we really had no idea. And after the Smarter Balance, all the third and fourth graders said, oh, it was easy. Um, I finished early. That's my favorite. You know, you go to a kid and they go, I finished early, Mrs. Green. OK. Um, and you read everything over, right? So I, I was very nervous about it. And when the scores came out, you know, I think we all went, oh, you know, they did really well. And then I pestered Jill to see if she heard from other districts. And then we saw that we did very well in comparison to other districts, not only in the DERG, but in the state. And so I felt kind of that our, it was a kind of a, a compliment to our curriculum, mm -hmm. to our teachers and to our kids, you know? And, and now we know more about the test, but I still don't think you can really 
prepare so much. You can't really teach to the test. Mm -hmm. We can just do the best job that we can with our own instruction and creating that kind of atmosphere in the classroom. Um, and, you know, also having some performance assessments that, you know, will give them a feeling for what it will be like. But you can't teach to that test. Mm -hmm. Nor would I, uh, even if we could figure out how to do it. And when I don't think we could, so. Thank you. <laughs> appreciate that. Anybody have anything else? Thank that you. They, we appreciate so much your coming and explaining these things and being here. Other things? Yes. I, I actually wanted to thank all of you for being here. I know you have very early mornings, and um, and this is a will be a e late evening. Um, and I also wanted to thank you know Dr. Crenti and all the department chairs because last year was a tough year. I mean, we had it was a it was a big transition. There was a lot of community angst, and um, as soon as those results came out on the state website, I was you know the big data geek looking at it, and I said to Jill, I said we did great. We had a lot of kids testing, and we did great. And, and so I think that's a, a, a testament to all the hard work and all of your love for education and, you know, and our kids. So I wanted to thank all of you because it, you know, it was a tough year, and, and I think we all knew it. So yes. um, thank you. Indeed. I think we all would say the same thank you to you, but we've tried to make that not something part of our policy to go <laughs> just thank you, but I think everyone would say the same thing. I think those being the questions, I think you should be allowed to also go home and, and <laughs> be, able to, be able to get up early again for tomorrow morning. That's great. And Deanna, you mentioned it, but while everyone's going, I think uh, Dr. Carenti certainly deserves special thanks. Uh, Sherry mentioned the technology and all of the issues with the technology and managing this. This wasn't the kind of thing where you set it up and let it run itself. This was the kind of thing you're monitoring by the minute and problem solving. You know, every couple, you never knew when something was going to come up and whether it was moving carts from school to school or whatever it was. Absolutely. Just try to get the microphone put back together. That's all right. That's more important. Oh. But it really, it was such an, an amazing effort and really so well done. And Terrific. Couldn't, Jill really shepherded the whole thing. Well, we have these wonderful booklets online so that parents, anybody who's watching, can look it up and They're follow already them. there. They're Absolutely. online. Right Terrific. Off of our, right off of our website, you can have the, uh, the testing presentations. And the SACS presentation we're about to receive is also online already. If, someone, if anyone wants to follow along at home, they're welcome to. That's do you want to open that up and uh, present that? Uh, start well, sure. that. Well, sure. Start just, that. I was just getting the presentation. No, no, no that, that's, that's perfect. Fine. That we are uh, fortunate to have our SACS building committee with us tonight. Uh, Jim Bell is here with Penny and, and members of the, the design team. Greg, of course, Alan, of course, are both also on the SACS building committee. Um, Bill Wobbert. They're going to give us. Bill Wobbert. Bill? Bill Walbert is here as well, uh, who's also on the SACS building committee, as is uh, Joanne is there, Sangeet is there, Hazel, uh, I'm there. Uh, <laughs> so it's been a team effort from the start, and so I think this is a, a great night for an, an update and information and presentation on the recommended project. The, I guess it was about two weeks ago we voted, the SACS building committee voted on the final, may have even been a little bit longer than that. Um, but so, Penny and Jim and the team are here to share with us that final presentation. Take it away. All right. Well, I would say if you uh, can't be in a reading lesson with Glenda Green, then you want to be on the SACS building committee. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing some uh, very hard but very exciting uh, work. So tonight, uh, we did just give an update uh, a couple of board of ed meetings ago. So I'm not, I don't want to review ev and everything we did then. So we're going to quickly go over some of what the uh, schedule developments have been. Uh, uh, JCJ is here to do a deeper dive into the design. Uh, we're going to review the costs uh, that we've, uh, that our project team has developed and then take your questions and uh, ask for your support for the project before we go on to the town bodies for funding approvals. So first, uh, just to introduce our team members again, this is Jim LaPasta from JCJ Architecture, uh, Jean Tyrone from SLAM, and Mark Jeffco from ONG Industries, who I don't think you've, uh, who hasn't been here before on this project. 
So you all know the three key parts to the Sachs uh, building project, renovate the 58-year-old auditorium, uh, which is now closed and kind of gutted, uh, to right-size the overcrowded uh, music rooms and add key storage for the auditorium so it can function most efficiently and for music instruments, and then to build an addition in the northwest corner of the Sachs uh, campus that's going to provide a net 12 more classrooms, which are needed uh, to deal with the enrollment increases and program changes we've had. This, we've gone over this project schedule before, and I guess what I, what I really wanted to say is uh, what imp has impressed me about this project as we got into it as a building committee is the community, as they looked at the needs at SACS uh, and, and the committee, wanted to provide uh, one project, uh, one construction project that would address the needs at SACS and really set the building up uh, for the future to address uh, the challenges that, that it faces and to provide the spaces needed for the next 10 plus years so that students and teachers can get maximum results from all the efforts that they put into it. And so we were pleased when the Board of Selectmen last January uh, expanded the scope of the committee to analyze these, uh, the, all the needs, including the classroom needs at SACS. Uh, just to kind of go over briefly, I think you all know, but we, we did go in front of the Board of Finance and the Town Council. Uh, we reviewed the needs that we uh, found with the classroom in the VP areas in uh, January, April, and May. We had pre-construction funds uh, that were approved by the Board of Finance and Town Council in May of $750,000. Uh, in June, we went over various project um, alternatives. We looked at what would happen if we did a one-story addition uh, that provided seven classrooms, a two-story addition with 12 classrooms, an addition where we just shelled the second story. We uh, figured out different costs for those. And so we looked at, we were trying to really uh, get the most value for the community through, through all those alternatives that we uh, presented and discussed. We told, when we presented in June to the town bodies, I believe we also told the, the Board of Education, we said in July, uh, because the schedule is proceeding, we were gonna have to pick one design uh, to move forward with. And we would come back in July and, and, and uh, report again and get their feedback. So we did go back in July. Uh, we reported that, that it looked like the best alternative was the one that I presented today, the t net 12 classroom recommendation that the EDO 49, uh, 049 had been filed at the end of June and that we were going to proceed with the 12 classroom option. So uh, since then, uh, design development and cost estimates and uh, the next big hearing coming up is there's going to be a public hearing uh, held by the town council on October uh, 21. That's at 7 p.m. at town hall. Uh, the Board of Finance has set November 10th, the regular meeting, as the date on which we're going to uh, present to them. And we're in discussions with Bill Walbert. We haven't set a final date yet uh, for the town council, but I'm sure that that date will be forthcoming uh, shortly. I think we've gone through the rest of the schedule with you. So what I'd like to do now is really turn it over to Jim LaPasta from JCJ to do a little bit of a deeper look at the design for the project. Thank you, Penny. Uh, good evening. I'm afraid I don't have a pointer, so I'll, I'll do my best to describe what you're looking at on the screen. I'm Jim LaPasta with JCJ Architecture. Um, what, uh, what you see right there is a site plan that shows the general scope of the project, which I think most of you are familiar with. If you look to the right side of the project, that's the, the main entry to Sachs uh, Middle School, uh, the auditorium, the music area, um, the renovations are going to happen there. We'll, we'll get into those in more detail. To the left, the area that is um, sort of pinkish orange towards the front would be the new addition that gives us the total of the 12 net classrooms. One of the things I wanted to stop and talk about here at, at this slide is that the project has been designed in such a way that no portable, no portable classrooms will be needed, that we can do all of the construction while the children are in the school in a very safe uh, and effective manner. By having the new classroom addition, that can be constructed first. Students moved into there and then renovations done on the other side of the building so that we can simply keep everyone in, in a, uh, in real space as opposed to temporary space for the entire time. I wanted to make that point. And the auditorium renovations, which would be within the, the box, if you will, of the auditorium, those are somewhat independent of any of the class space because as you all well know, that area has been closed, the abatement's been done. So right now it's essentially a big box, quite literally, and we'll be putting things back to create a, to recreate 
the auditorium, which I'll show you momentarily, and that can kind of run on its own, its own schedule. So we're able to, by designing the, the project with the addition and the renovations, we're able to kind of accomplish all of it working with ONG Industries as the construction manager and SLAM as your owner's project manager to move things around in a way that, that, that everyone will always be in permanent space. See if that works. So this is a, just a quick view. This is what the new, uh, this is the existing renovation that we did in the late 90s uh, on the right, and then to the left would be the new construction. It really has been designed to match the existing um, with the, to the extent that it can. There's some minor modifications because of the grade, but it, it, if all intents and purposes, it will look like the, exist, the new construction that was done in the, in the 97, 99 edition. So to the left, you're seeing the new two-story classroom wing. And this is the view a little closer up from Farm Road, where the new ring, wing is in the foreground. To the left, you're seeing the end of the library. To the right, the main entry. It'll be the same brick, the same, the same windows, the same materials, so that it all kind of looks like it was all done at the same time. And I, I, our, our goal would be nobody would ever know there was an addition, that you'd just all think this was the way the school always was. I was looking over in the corner at the black and white photo of the, the building before we started in the 90s, which is kind of interesting to, to look back at. It looked very different. So if we, if we look at the auditorium and music area for, uh, for just a second, we can talk through the, the scope of the work here. Um, starting in the center where the auditorium is, the, essentially right now there is an empty box there as everything's been abated. So we will be putting back, um, the original seats are being refurbished, will be replaced uh, with new cushions and, and, uh, and the mechanisms refurbished. We'll be replacing the ceilings, the walls, creating an acoustically appropriate um, box. Uh, the old box was not very acoustically appropriate. Uh, I'll get into that in a bit more detail. Um, to the bottom of that drawing, the area with the curve, there'll be some work done in there to improve the instrument storage. There's a minor renovation in that area across the bottom uh, to upgrade uh, instrument storage areas and do a little bit of other work uh, in that area. To the right of the drawing where it says band, there will be two rooms combined into a single larger flat floor band room. There's currently uh, risers that are built into the floor in the coral room. Those will be demolished uh, and combined with the room next door and to create an appropriately sized band room. Um, <clears throat> if you go directly above the auditorium where the current art rooms are, um, you may recall that years ago that was the auditorium. We converted them to art rooms. We will now convert those art rooms into a large flat floor coral area. The reason I, I talk about these being flat floors is that's really the most efficient way to use the space. It can be reconfigured and used for a variety of ways. Um, the the built-in risers really become a, an impediment over the long term to the uh, efficiency of the room. Next to the coral room, we'll be creating a, a large stage storage area. That's been one of the one of the kind of Achilles heels of the school. There's no place to put all the really cool stuff that the kids build that's needed. Um, so that there'll be a large stage storage area where you can move both equipment off the stage as well as uh, store sets and props and things like that. If you go to the far right, there's a room in yellow, sort of yellow, called classroom. Uh, that's, a, that's a room that will be reclaimed. It's a current art room that will be reclaimed as a general classroom in that area. And then directly above that, uh, it says construction and uh, storage. Right now, it's more storage than construction. By creating the new storage area, we'll be able to move everything out of that room and, and actually, without very much work, uh, be able to, you'll be able to use it actually for construction, for set construction and, and that kind of work. So it'll just sort of reclaim that space uh, from storage. And then across the way, there's a ceramics room that's gonna remain in place. There was some conversation about moving it, but it's a, it's a pretty big investment, in it, so it will remain uh, in that location. Uh, this is a kind of aerial view. If you pulled the pulled the roof off, that uh, you can kind of see in the middle, you've got the uh, you've got the the stage uh, and the auditorium, and we've added. Uh, I think when you add the furniture in, you can kind of get a sense of the scale. So to the left and right of the auditorium, you see the the orchestra and, and band rooms, or vocal rooms with the the seating, and then um, uh, the other rooms with the furniture in them. Give you a sense of the the size. I think one of the things you'll see about both of the new music rooms is they're approximately the same size as the stage, which is great. It, it gives you the, the room you need for the programming. It also allows you rehearsal space so that you can, you can rehearse while other things are happening on the stage, which again increases the ability of the, the school to use the spaces appropriately for educational use. This is a cross-section through the new 
auditorium, the revised auditorium. What's there now is just the box. Um, what we will be doing is um, there'll be work done in the stage fly area to refurbish uh, the, the, the existing stage equipment that's there. We'll be adding something called a, a loading uh, bridge, which is essentially an area uh, that makes it safer to move the move the the lines up and down. It's a it's a sort of a catwalk back there that the that would not be accessible to students, but it'll make it easier and safer to uh, to move scenery up and down. The ceiling is being replaced right now. It's gone. It was part of the abatement because it had been uh, ultimately contaminated. We'll be replacing it with a new segmented ceiling, which has been designed with our acoustical consultant out of New York, actually out of Norwalk, I'm sorry, Jaffe, um, to actually be appropriate for middle school students so that it, uh, we'll still have an audio system in here to enhance the sound, but this will provide a much better uh, acoustic environment with no dead spots. Currently, there's some areas in the room that are completely dead. We're moving the mechanical equipment out of the room onto the roof behind it so that the mechanical noise that's been a problem, will not be a problem anymore, so we're moving that, uh, that out of there. The side walls are being replaced more or less in the same configuration they were. Uh, they'll be wood, uh, but with an upper area of fabric that's a sound absorbing material, so we're essentially tuning the room to provide the appropriate acoustics. So it, it'll kind of feel the same when you walk in, but it'll be different, and the acoustics will be different. And then to the rear, where there is currently um, uh, an old projection booth, quite literally up above, We'll be opening that up so that you can use it for follow spots and the position for the sound and lighting board is actually gonna be down in the main house which is really the appropriate place to have it so that the, the, the people working it can hear what's going on. So there'll be a location for that and um, we actually have a view of it. So here's a, a rendering uh, that we had done that shows, that shows the, uh, the new space in use. Uh, there'll be some lighting to accent the, the panels on the side. Those red stripes you see are actually sound absorbing material. Um, you've got the, you can I think get a sense that the ceiling instead of being one big large uh, solid ceiling with those big round vents that used to be in it is a more segmented ceiling again tuned for acoustics. Uh, this is a view from the stage looking back. So everything in red <clears throat> that you see there is actually a sound absorbing material. Everything in the, in the brown is a sound reflecting material which would be a wood panel. So it'll have a nice warm rich, rich feel to it. Uh, the lights that you see are from a new catwalk that's being installed in the room, uh, in the auditorium itself, in the house. That'll provide a lot more flexibility for lighting. Right now, the lights that are up there were not really accessible, so we'll have new, uh, a new lighting. The lighting system you have is actually in really good shape. That's one of the things that was determined by the, by the consultant that we, we brought in. Um, the dimmer panel is dusty and dirty and needs cleaning but it's, it's really in good shape to be reused. That'll be reused. You own a lot of lights that are gonna be reused and then we'll be supplementing those with newer light fixtures, some new lighting locations, including that, that catwalk and setting you up for LED fixtures so that down the road, um, you'll be able to, to, as you add lights, be able to use LEDs which are more energy efficient and sort of the, the wave uh, of the future. So all of that'll be in there. There'll be a sound system installed as I mentioned before um, it's a, a kind of a basic middle school appropriate sound system, but it gives you flexibility to expand it in the future. So you can add additional microphones, add additional amplifiers. It will have all the appropriate uh, ADA um, requirements so that there'll be assisted lis assistive listening in the room uh, for, for performances. You'll have the ability to videotape uh, performances, which I know is done. So we'll be having lo locations for, uh, for cameras. So it'll all be in there and we're designing it or it's being designed so that it's expandable so that you can add equipment as, as budgets and time allow over the year. So it's not a kind of closed thing, but it's an open-ended system. But you'll be starting with everything you need to, to have a, a good performance. You can certainly enhance that over time. And that's, the, that's generally the scope of the auditorium. If we move on to the farm road side of the school, we have a two-story classroom addition. Uh, on the, this is the ground floor, and on the ground floor, this is where we're relocating the art rooms, the ones that were over uh, in next to the auditorium that are being displaced to make room for the choral room are being relocated here. So you have four appropriately sized art rooms. Uh, across the hall from those, you have a relocated STEM uh, room. You have a, a, a science room that can be either science or STEM. It's being set up to be very flexible. And then in between the two of those is something called the Fab Lab, which is for fabrication, and that's a room that supports 
Uh, it's a place for equipment to be where they actually do construction. If you've been in the STEM room, pretty crowded, lots of tools. You kind of like to keep the tools separate from the kids if you can so they can be under control. But this is a f almost a full-size room, so it'll have a lot of flexibility. Again, it offers you a lot of options as this building uh, ages over the next 10 to, to 20 years in terms of how you use this space. It'll all have the appropriate power, water, ventilation, and you can use it in a variety of different ways. To the right in yellow, there on the ground floor, there's a flex classroom, it's being called. We're calling it that because because of its location, it's a little bit larger than a standard classroom, and it's larger because there was a gap between the new construction and the existing building. So we're looking at filling that gap. Um, part of that will have a, the, this room is, is, um, will have some additional sinks in it so that again it can be a regular classroom or it could flex to be a, an additional science room or art room in the future depending on what's, what's needed. And we'll, we'll talk in a few minutes about, about the budget and how this, this plays into that. So again, this is, uh, if you pull off, the, pull off the top floor, this gives you a sense of it. Uh, the corridors connect back through, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that. Uh, up at the top, uh, where you see the special ed room, we're going through that last classroom, so we're, we're replacing that full-size classroom in the addition and then creating a somewhat smaller classroom for special ed, which right-sizes that room. You don't really need a full-size room, so it, again, makes the building more efficient. And the corridor is in, a, is in a U shape, connecting at both ends, which is both a code requirement, but also continues the pattern of loops that are in the building, which make it a very efficient building to manage, so students are, always have multiple ways to get around. Um, nothing worse than dead ends. So this is, this is the overall building to give you a sense of scale. You can kind of see in the right side, it comes fairly close to the existing bus loop, but, but it doesn't touch it, so we don't have to move the, the existing driveway. That stays, that stays in place. Um, and then up on the second floor, this is purely classrooms. So up here we have uh, eight, nine classrooms, plus uh, on both levels we have appropriate student and faculty bathrooms as well as other support space we need for electrical and mechanical stuff that's required to, to support the building. These are the same size classrooms as, as the rest of the school. Again, we have a special ed room, slightly smaller, right-sized room on the second floor. And then uh, we have a stair, uh, a new stair that's required by code in the lower right corner to, to exit this level. And at the other end, we have a small uh, bump out, which is, uh, serves two purposes. It's called breakout. It, it's, it's similar to the ones that are in the original building uh, that provide for out-of-classroom instruction, which is really part of the middle school teaming philosophy. Uh, but it also provides on the exterior that kind of aesthetic transition that keeps the building, keeps the wing consistent with the rest of the building. And, and given that it's such a prominent location on the corner of, of, the, of the site, it seemed appropriate that we make sure the building look as though it's, it's um, blending in with the rest of the, the school. Uh, this is the second floor, which just shows you the different arrangements of furniture. Uh, one of the things you want to make sure you're doing is allowing rooms that will be flexible. So you can do desks in a row, you can do desks in clusters, you can do different shaped desks that are available. These rooms will accommodate kind of whatever you want to do with them in the future. They're a very flexible room that will accommodate a variety of different kind of teaching modalities. I believe it's back to you. So, uh, you know, as we had said before, uh, this is not a, a project that we designed to meet the uh, absolute max uh, enrollment that Sachs was going to go to. And in fact, uh, based upon the current uh, numbers that we have, uh, basically the, what I met with uh, Greg Macedo today, and this is what we determined, what we, this project would probably do with the 12 net new classrooms is we would uh, take four of them, uh, take undersized classes that are an undersized general undersized academic classrooms now and put them in appropriately sized. Because we do this, we can then put the special ed classes back into the special ed classrooms and we can reclaim for the small teacher team rooms to be used as they were originally designed uh, for teacher parent meetings, for teacher collaboration, uh, uh, just to have a, uh, another space uh, for meetings for uh, special ed and, and a variety of uses. We would take two classrooms and use them for general enrollment. Uh, gener take two classrooms and use it for enrollment growth. We would right size two science labs, uh, right size an additional special education room, 
uh, restore the World Language Lab, which was turned into a general classroom this year. We would restore one, the computer lab, which was turned into a general classroom this year, to a computer lab. And be, uh, this would also enable the retention of the art music lab, which had been uh, scheduled uh, to potentially go offline due to increasing enrollments. This does not meet all the needs that SACS has, but we think it, it's an excellent project. Just to, but just to let you know, it, if enrollments continue to max out and go up to four, uh, 1375 or 1400 or over, uh, we would lose a computer lab. Uh, we still are not putting in a teacher multipurpose or dining room. We're still using one hall alcove. Uh, there's still one science classroom that's undersized. Uh, storage spaces that have been converted to educational spaces will continue to be used as educational spaces. The curriculum directors uh, who were here earlier this evening, they're going to continue to um, office down in, in, in the uh, basement area. But that's not to state that this project is not uh, going to be a tremendous advance for the situation at SACS. It's going to deal with overcrowding. I just wanted to point these out to show that we, we are not overbuilding. So what are the advantages of proceeding now? Basically, SACS is over capacity now, and it's going to remain so with increasing enrollment, uh, varying maybe from the current projections are from 1333 to 1376. It will allow uh, reclaiming the language lab and computer lab, and it will solve the problems by the fall of 2017 and allow two summers for construction. Delaying will raise the cost significantly. There's interest rate risk as well as construction escalation, which goes at 4 or 5% annually. So I wanted to turn it back uh, to Jim LaPasta mm -hmm. to go over the construction of the project. Um, as you're aware, we've been, uh, as a team, working on estimates at every step of the way to try to understand uh, really what, what the market will, will, will say about this project when you go to bid. And these are, these are budget estimates based on, uh, based on our knowledge. We had an independent estimator. Uh, SLAM Collaborative had, an, had their estimators look at it. But mostly this is, this is now we've got a construction manager on board. So ONG Industries has used their experience with a variety of projects, including this one, uh, and current work that they have to, to do their best to understand when we go out to bid next year what the cost might be. And there's things we know for sure, and there's things that we don't know yet. So they've recommended contingency funds to, to allow for those in the future. So what you have up here is a summary of the estimate that we've been working on with ONG. It's ONG's estimate that we've worked to, to help them over the last uh, month or so, I guess, we've, we've probably worked on it. Um, there's been a process called value management that we've gone through where we've looked at the drawings very carefully to make sure that the sizes are as tight as they can be, that we're not building more than, than you've requested. We've looked at the materials to make sure that the systems and materials are the most efficient. Uh, we've looked at all the systems that I described earlier in the auditorium to make sure we're not doing more than was originally called for in the scope. So we've really spent some time trying to tighten the drawings and the, and the descriptions down. And this is where we, we currently stand during what's called DD or design development. Um, so the first, the, the categories are construction costs. Um, simplistically, these would be the costs you would expect on bid day when you open the envelopes. This is what the contractor uh, is going to charge you to, to build the project. Then you've got soft costs, which are all of the other things you need for a project, which would include the professional fees for the, for the uh, owner's project manager, for the architect, for the lawyers, for the, the construction manager. Uh, there'll be furniture fees. There'll be a lot of other things. There'll be testing that you need. And then there are going to be contingencies. Uh, and the contingencies start fairly large. And then as time goes on, they, and you know more about the project, they get a little bit smaller. And by the time you go to bid, we would expect them to be somewhere around 10% in total. So with that as background, right now, um, if you look at how this breaks out, it's a little over $14 million, including a, a contingency for the construction manager of about 5% is what the current estimate is for the hard construction costs. The owner's soft costs, which include, um, see, is this lining up right? Yeah, that's the 1.9. Uh, the owner's soft costs, which include all of the non-construction items, furniture, equipment fees is about 1.9 million. And then there's a series of contingencies and escalation that ONG is recommending based on their experience, which include a design contingency, an estimating contingency, escalation, uh, as Penny mentioned, the construction market escalates fairly, fairly rapidly. Um, so you've got about a, a, over nine, the next nine months till we're actually bidding, about 3.75%. 
There's an owner's contingency, which is for items uh, on the owner's side of the ledger, which gives you a, a total contingency of about, uh, well, just under 18% for $2.5 million of contingency monies, which are, as of yet, just that, they're contingency. Those will be for things that are either developed during the project or things that, that come up um, as we move forward that we don't know about yet. So that, if you add all that together, it brings you to a total project cost right now of $18.6 million in terms of the, the overall cost of the project. That's, that's on one side of the ledger. On the other side of the ledger is your state reimbursement. Um, when we last talked to you, we thought the state reimbursement would be about a million dollars based on our, our estimates at that time. And as I've said, we get better information as we go along. So we've met with the state a couple times uh, and talked to them about what's eligible for reimbursement and what's not eligible. Um, and one of the things we've, de we've determined is that because of the work in the auditorium in particular, which had to do with the abatement of hazardous materials, everything that was removed from the auditorium that needs to be replaced now falls into the reimbursable category. I mean, the reason we took it all out, the reason we took the ceilings out was because they were contaminated, needed to be removed. That means you get reimbursed for the stuff you put back. So that, the net result, just to sort of cut to the chase, is that we believe the reimbursement for the state is about $2.4 million now. So your reimbursement has, has increased significantly after conversations with the state about what's reimbursable and what's not. So that, what that ultimately does is means that the estimated net cost to the town stays at about $16.1 million. So just to repeat, to be clear, although the overall project costs right now, including contingencies, and there are more contingencies built in now than we had earlier recommended based on ONG's recommendation, even though we're at $18.6 million, the net cost to the town of New Canaan has stayed at 16.1 because of the way things move and you know things go in things go out and that's just sort of the normal the normal way these processes go so that's that's kind of the summary of of costs well, i think so the only other thing There's i'd say I is just yeah. that um, with respect to the reimbursement from the state i think to be really accurate we had said 1 million to 1.5 million okay, yeah. before and uh, this 2.4 million is again our conservative number we will also be you could it could, explain it could the go, space, well, space waivers yeah it actually could go as high as 2.8 i think was our was our top right, i think this it was 2.4 to 2.8 worth yeah. um, 350,000 yeah the there, there's a couple things uh, one is um, there's always a little bit of of give and take on the actual costs of what's reimbursable what isn't the biggest the biggest thing that could change is applying for a, a space waiver from the state uh, you need to apply for it. Um, Sachs Middle School, because of its age, um, was over the allowed square footage when it was originally, when we did the renovations in, in the 90s. Uh, it was bigger than is allowed by current um, funding guidelines. But because it's existing, you can apply for a space waiver. If that was granted, that could increase your, your allocation. I wouldn't recommend counting on that. That's why we've, we've indicated the, uh, the lower number, but that's certainly an option. Uh, that we'll be pursuing is to apply for a waiver on, this, on the space standards. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think to speak for the state on whether they'll grant it or not, uh, but certainly it's worth, uh, it's worth applying for. It's worth significant money if they would recognize the fact that it's, a, it's an existing building. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions? Anybody have questions that they want to ask? Oh, just, uh, yep. just one more thing. So oh, okay. basically, we wanted to, um, when you go through those hard courses and you look at it, uh, it is about 40% a renovation project. Uh, if you think of it, the coral room, we're taking out those cement risers. They were original. They were not addressed back in the 97 to 99 project, nor was the uh, auditorium addressed, as we all know. So really about in the hard costs, uh, and it would filter up to the soft, soft costs as well, 40% renovation, 60% uh, new construction. When you figure this out, um, and Amy Murphy Carroll helped us with this annual. If you do this, 16.2 uh, million net uh, to the town, uh, that is about uh, debt service of about 1.06 million a year, which ends up being $148 per taxable account per year using 7,122 taxable accounts. If you go by $100,000 of assessed value, it comes out to about $13 per year. So that means a home assessed at a million dollars at the assessed value, just to remind everyone, is 70% of the market value. Uh, so the uh, home assessed at a million dollars would pay $130 uh, per year for the bonding. 
So to summarize, the, we have been working hard. The project design and development is proceeding on schedule. The most critical pending item here now is to get funding approval by the Board of Finance and the Town Council by the end of November for the full project. That is uh, a requirement before you can apply to the state uh, for permission to bid the project. Uh, so we have the Board of we're pleased to tell everyone we have the Board of Finance review and vote scheduled for November 10th. That, and town council will be set uh, shortly. And just to summarize, we think that uh, this recommended project sets SACS on the right path and does it once and does it right. So it, with that, I wanted to open it up to questions for the project team. Sure. Um, I just want to actually start by thanking Penny and the entire SACS building committee, Jim, um, for your leadership and for your tireless efforts. And as best I can tell, this has been a full-time job for Penny for, for at least the past year. Jim, too. And they're not getting paid for this full-time job. So I just think it's extraordinary, um, the leadership and the effort. And Penny and Jim both, their kids are well beyond the school, school age. So thank you on behalf of our ch children. Um, I fully support this whole project. And I just want to make one note, and then I'm going to ask a question. But one note on the timeline is that I know you went through everything the SACS Building Committee has done, but actually the school system has been monitoring the enrollment very closely for a long time. I actually served on an official study group back in 2012. Um, chaired by Gary Cass, and at that time, we already came to the same conclusion that SACS was overcrowded and that we needed more space. Um, at the time, we uh, recommended that we continue to monitor the enrollment um, very closely and, and, and to take decision, to take action as needed. Um, but what we know now, stand, standing here now, is that the enrollment projections have materialized, and we know that based on the kids already in our um, elementary schools, that the SACS enrollment will continue to rise and remain steady. So I, I just feel so strongly that the time to act is now. Actually, I think we waited too long, but <laughs> the time to act is now. Um, this is an expensive project. Is there any way that you can pull the project apart and do it in stages, or is this, because I've heard a lot of people say that maybe we can't afford this whole project now. Um, is there any way, for those people that are asking that question, that this project can be pulled apart with any efficiency you, you or? Can, you, could, you could pull it apart. I think um, we anticipated this question for once. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it, it had been put to us. Uh, could we split the project apart and do the, just the auditorium now and leave all the classroom and the music room renovations uh, for later? What, what that would do is it would leave the academic program as overcrowded as it is today in need of the 12 classrooms due to the overcapacity. It would leave the music program in spaces about half the appropriate size uh, that they need. It, and it means that the renovated auditorium cannot be optimally used because we're still going, it will have no storage to support it. Um, the risers and the shell will be stored on the stage as before. And uh, we can have ONG talk more about it too, but we said, what would it cost, I said, if you waited three years uh, to do the uh, construction on the classroom? And the estimate was that uh, it would be 2.9 million net of, after you got back your state reimbursement, 3.4 and then reduced to 2.9 with the money you'd get back from the state. And I think if you waited two years to do it, it would be, uh, the numbers would be a little bit, uh, a little bit lower than that. Right. So it would, it would cost a lot more and it would leave SACS uh, overcrowded. What this does not take into account is uh, any action that this board uh, might do uh, with respect to portables. It's not taking that into account. If uh, this board, if the project is turned down, decides uh, that portables are an uh, appropriate option. So we didn't, did not take that into account. And just to follow on comment, um, I was actually going to mention the fact that I appreciate that this plan um, is made possible with no portable space because I think in today's security environment, um, for me personally, portables are not acceptable. And so t to your point, Penny, I, I would never support being on the Board of Ed an option where we add classroom space through portables because I think that in today's security environment, it's just not something that we can consider. So that's something I really do like about this plan. 
Deanna. I have two questions, slightly uh, unrelated. Um, the first one is, I think, could you or Dr. Lutze or the combination of you um, just review for people sort of the work of the demographers and, and in sort of forecasting out the enrollment numbers, because um, I think, you know, there have been questions in the community about the enrollment numbers, you know, you know, everybody looks at sort of what's happening in the local area with companies leaving, and they said, well, well how good are those numbers? So I, I think it would be helpful to reiterate sort of the work of the demographers and, and what they did. I will just state, I will turn it over to Dr. Luxie, who has become our uh, demographer, but just state that when I was talking uh, with uh, Dr. Kennedy, who does this for a living, he said, you know, you need to consider that you're part of the tri-state area, uh, not just part of Connecticut, but I'll let uh, Dr. Luxie respond. Right, so I'm really a junior demographer, um, <laughs> but just, just quickly to talk, talk about it, uh, quite a bit of work does go into developing the demographic the projections, uh, but they are just projections, right? So each year we do have them updated. We send our information to uh, NASDAQ and they'll work through that. But they will be looking at things like housing starts, they'll look at um, new construction as they're going, they'll look at sales and transfers of homes, sales and transfers of condominiums, they look at um, you know, the, the number of births in the community, they'll go back five years looking at births and trying to figure out the kindergarten enrollment numbers. One of our challenges has been uh, that there's a gap has grown through the years between the number of births five years out and then the number of students who come into kindergarten. Um, so they're trying, and they try to interpret what those trends mean and they look at things uh, and make determinations such as uh, their families are, moving into town after their children are born instead of moving into New Canaan and then starting their family here, which makes sense when you think about the price of entry and things. Um, but that makes it more difficult to then predict those kindergarten numbers because you don't have uh, a, a reliable ratio to use. Uh, they, when they put together the projections they used was called a cohort survival method, which essentially looks at um, the numbers through the years. They'll do a historical look and see how they change first grade to second grade to third grade. And the reason they change is something they call in-migration, which is students who are moving, or families that are moving into our town while they're in the grades. So if we, and they typically, uh, those numbers have been pretty high for the last couple of years. This last year, that number was a little bit lower, that in-migration, where the number, the uh, sizes still went up, uh, but not as much as we had expected. They also do take a close look at the number of students per grade who are enrolled in a private school or a non, the non-public school uh, and work to try to factor all of that in. So really quite a bit of work goes into this. Uh, and actually when we received the projections this year, we scheduled a conference call with Dr. Kennedy who works up at NASDAQ um, and Gary, Penny, uh, Hazel and I mm -hmm. had a phone conference with Dr. Kennedy to try to understand again a little more about, about the projections and how they run. Again, they're trying to predict what's going to happen in the future, so it's tricky. Um, but he, you know, we were able to share some really important information in doing that. It really is an interesting science that they, they work. And there's probably a little bit of art to it as well. Uh, but the, you know, the amount of work that goes into the projections really is, uh, well, it's, it's stunning to see how much care is taken in putting these things together. Um, and so we continue to work on it. Gary, is there anything that? Well, I was just gonna uh, add um, that next, at our next board meeting, I'll be doing a, a presentation around what these actual numbers uh, look like that we have received from NASDAQ. We'll review it along with the uh, reports that we normally do around this time of year, the staff utilization reports. Uh, so w we're going to be able to present uh, at our next board meeting a variety of reports that I will hope to get to the board uh, prior to uh, the meeting so that you can take a look and um, and see what these numbers look like. And we're gonna give you a lot of the information that Dr. Kennedy has provided this year. It'll be more information than we normally uh, provide, but we think it'll be particularly helpful, especially um, given all the um, challenges around looking at these numbers. But um, they, uh, the, the, the past history of NASDAQ and reporting these numbers has been uh, extraordinarily accurate, and I'll be talking a little bit about that um, at our next board meeting. Okay. 
And then just uh, one other question. Um, November 10th is the Board of Finance uh, meeting to approve this project if, you know, that we've, that you've presented, correct? Or we'll be asking the Board of Finance right. for funding mm -hmm. approval. Okay. And they'll, and they'll need to fund the full $18.6 Okay. So bonding resolution. Um, just so I think members of the community and the board are clear, if the Board of Finance, um, I guess uh, two questions. When do you need to have approval by to be able to move forward so that the project can be completed on the time schedule that we have all heard about. Um, you know, what's sort of the the drop dead date that we need to to have everything done? Well, I mean, end of November is so. Is, that so really, the November tenth. If 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 the if the board of finance doesn't approve on November tenth, then we will not have the ability to have this project completed. In, in two summers, really, is that is that is that a fair assessment? I mean, I, I think we need to all understand sort of what the. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more of a uh, cost. Gene, do you want to? I, I think yeah. you need to come. This is Gene Trump from Slam. Hi. So the 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 longer you wait, the more there's a risk of. Uh, we, we ideally you want to bid in January. That's the ideal market, and in January or February, the the longer you push that, you risk. Um, uh, price increases from the subcontractors as they book up their work for the summer. And you also risk the potential of not having procurement in enough time in order to get the stuff that you need for the summer work. So there's a lot of pressure to kind of get everything bid out and ready to go um, by March 1st. So bid it in January, early February, have the results in order to make an award in March. So that's why the push to kind of get ready by the end of November, because there's probably about a two month period of a state review that's going to take um, in order for them to give us permission to go out to bid. So that's another risk. And actually, I think, oops, oh, sorry. How do I get that back? <laughs> back arrow. So, I, Mark, I don't know if you want to talk about this. Lauren in your office prepared it, but basically it shows that in the uh, summer of uh, 2016, one of the things you'd want to do is do the foundations and the steel work. And steel is one of the long lead time items. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Come to the mic. Step to the mic. <laughs> Typically, with the um, the steel fabrication, shop drawings and fabrication, it's by the time that you award the contract, it's usually forty or it's usually four months before we actually see steel on the job. So you really want to back up from the really the start of the summer four months to when you really want to release that steel contractor to, to fabricate, to start the shop drawings, fabricate the steel and get it ready to ship to the site. Mm. So that, that's really the biggest issue. And then the other thing really is, is to, to not lose that, that first summer. And we really want to, what we really want to do is get into the, uh, the renovation areas and do any abatement that we have um, in those spaces, get them cleaned back up, get them turned over back to the school so they could have the full year use of that, mm. of those spaces. And then the following summer, the two month period that we have is to renovate those spaces. So it really is really critical to, to get us that, that summer, that first summer for construction, but equally critical is getting the contracts awarded in, um, in March or by March so that we could start that process with the shop drawings and, and fabrication of all the long lead items. Mm -hmm. Questions, Sherry? So I, my next question is actually for Greg. <laughs> Um, I just w wanted to ask you to expand on some of the compromises that the teachers, that your teachers have had to make in the overcrowded conditions. I mean, I know previously the Sachs Building Committee presented um, scenarios where currently teachers are teaching in undersized classroom spaces. They're also teaching in non-classroom spaces like alcoves and um, storage closets, et cetera. But can you expand on the types of compromises that our teachers are having to make? and? how that's affecting our students' education? Sure. The, the first reaction I have to the slide we just viewed is that um, people need to understand if this project doesn't start, quote, on time, we don't see an auditorium ready to use again um, at the best schedule until mid-year of 1617. Mm -hmm. And that's if everything starts on time. 
So I think there's almost an idealism in the parent community that that first summer is going to solve our auditorium problem, and it doesn't. So I can only offer that in terms of heightening everybody's sense of urgency. Um, with regard to uh, the continuing compromises that we make at, at the site, I, I think that you know I can applaud the professional faculty for not making this uh, a point. Um, but given the question tonight, it really is below standard for our community to be educating children in substandard space. And, and I think that the audit done by the SLAM collaborative um, is an unbiased audit. You, you expect the principal to cry foul, but when you bring in the experts and they show that the um, music program is undersized by 50% and the academic programs undersized by roughly 30%, th those are compelling figures. Other questions that people might have? Allison? Not really a question, but I just want to say, you know, what's obvious is that we have, you know, Penny Ration and Jim Bell who've chaired this committee. You, you can't find two finer people in our community who have approached this project with no agenda other than to create the appropriate uh, construction project to provide the best educational experience and meet the needs of our kids. We have an incredible committee that represents the entire community, from our town funding bodies to our parents to administration, and everybody's put in a tremendous amount of hours, as, as we've stated before. We know the need is here. That you've defined that. You guys have done such a tremendous job in vetting this and slicing and dicing this project every possible way. There's no question that we don't need this project. So I think some of the um, comments from people and saying, well, you know, this came up very suddenly. As Sherry mentioned, the Enrollment Committee has been dealing with this for a couple of years. The Board of Education has been talking about the possibility of portable classrooms for a couple of years. Um, Alan Sneath can uh, tell us how many years we took the study for the auditorium out of the budget when the budget increase requests were cut and something had to go and that was a big ticket item. So we've talked about looking at the auditorium for multiple years now. Um, whether or not in terms of the town can afford it, we know the town can afford it. It's a matter of whether or not the town has the appetite for it and that's, that's reasonable. That's reasonable for the town. So I want to make sure that everyone in the community knows that there is, and, and Penny had mentioned this earlier, there is a town council, a public hearing on Wednesday night at 6, 7, 7, at 7 o'clock. 7 p.m. and then we'll do the same presentation at 7.30 p.m. And where is that going to be, Penny? It'll be at town hall. Uh, town hall. Okay. On upstairs in the main uh, conference room. Okay, so for members President. of the community, this is your opportunity to come out as taxpayers and to either you know come and support the support the project or perhaps you're not in support of the project but this is a democracy and all the taxpayers should come and they should let the public know and let the funding bodies know where they stand on this project because we feel very confident the committee's approved it you've spent as sherry said i mean hours you know thousands of hours on this project the board of education has approved this project so now it's really a matter of the town approving this project so i encourage anybody who's watching and to tell everybody that they know to come out and to speak their mind because I think this is really important. People moved to this town for the education. We all are fully aware of that and it's our responsibility to maintain a proper proper facilities so that we can um, all the money that we put into education that we can create these opportunities and continue to provide this wonderful education um, for our students. So I hope we get a good turnout from the town. I think this is something that's really important that people pay attention to. It's a big ticket item. I think the idea of dividing this my personal unprofessional opinion is ridiculous. Um, a, it'll cost us more money, and B, we, I've always said, as we know, that our first mission is the safety of our students. Why would we bring construction onto the campus of Sachs twice if we can do it once? Um, and on, in terms of the overcrowded classrooms, anybody who's had middle school students, you try to put three kids in an SUV um, that, that you know, should only have two, never mind try to put over 20 students into a classroom where there really shouldn't be that number of students. So I think we, we do a phenomenal job. I think Greg, as I mentioned before, has done a phenomenal job. And I think sometimes we get penalized a little bit. We put pressure on ourselves as a board to be good stewards for the town. Uh, the town puts pressure on us to be good students for the town, as they should. And I think sometimes what we do is we put up with things maybe longer than we should because we don't want to go forward and ask for money. Um, we're at a point now where we are going forward asking for money. I agree with you. We've probably put up with things a little bit longer than we should, we should have, but we're here now. 
And I don't think there's any question about this. And I would hate to see us penalized for, because people saying, well, this is new. We haven't heard about this. Mm -hmm. um, I think Greg and his crew have done a phenomenal job in managing that school. And I think we're all reached a point where we're saying it can't be managed this way anymore. It's not fair to the faculty. It's not fair to the students. It's not fair to the community. So I just encourage everybody to come out on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, at the town hall. And please speak your mind on the project. So thank you all for all the hard work that you've done. Yes, thank you. Well said, Allison. Um, I just wanted to also just just kind of bring up to the fact because I don't think people realize just you know how much the, the faculty have helped to to work with the situation. Um, we've taken away all their spaces <coughs> for collaboration. Their multi-purpose dining room has been uh, rechanged into a general classroom. They're, they've lost their team rooms. They have no space. If anyone knows with any large company, if you're working someplace, they have a space to take a break or do something. There's nothing for our faculty who works really hard with a lot of children. And if you ever work with a lot of kids, you know you need a little space sometimes. <laughs> and I know our town uh, officials you know, understand the importance of having break room spaces. I know the new town hall has I think two or three different um, break rooms, you know, one on each floor. It's an important factor for the sanity and being able to teach well as well. So I want to applaud our teachers for doing all they have and being able to give that up just so that the kids can the spaces that they need. But I agree, we don't have any more space available. And we now are definitely, you know, over 100, 127 kids beyond what our, the capacity of that building is. And we know more are coming. So there's not a thought about, look, let's wait and see. If we want to do this project, we know we need to have it. This is what we need to do. The, it's been well vetted. It's been researched as um, by the committee in all different ways, as, as Allison said. And I think we need to also think about well, what if the uh, Board of Finance does not approve funding for this? We do need to keep, come up with some kind of alternatives and look at that and, and weigh that when we're considering the decision about funding or not, you know, when, I, when the town officials look at this. Um, what is the alternative? Because we can't keep going the same way because there's no more space. And so the only thing I can think of is having to resort to portables, which is, again, something I don't think our community wants, nor do we want to go to. I mean, in addition to not looking good, I mean, there's issues with air quality, as you um, mentioned already, but security, um, leaks. Um, there's so many situations. And how do you bring, for example, when Greg gets those you know, kids coming in, that music space, he has to, all the kids have to take choir, they have to take band, they have to take orchestra. And now you have 100 kids, and you have not this large uh, flex room that's being proposed to put those kids. Are you going to then divide those choir groups? I mean, how are you going to do the programming? I mean, so we're really at a pivotal point where we have to say, we've got to do something. And if it can't be this, if, if the town decides it's not where they want to put their money, we need to know what, they need to be aware of what the alternative is going to be because we're going to have to do something. Um, there's a lot of capital projects that are on the town, you know, and we have to balance. I don't envy their job of figuring out which is more important. But some of the feedback I've gotten from parents and even non-parents is that education is important in our committee. Um, and they would prioritize that over doing some of the other projects that are being considered. Yes, Jen. So I have to say something, because I agree with what everyone's saying, but I just have to thank you all for everything that you've done. It's been tremendous. I know it's such a load and hard work, but I know you guys are passionate about it, as all of us are as well. And, you know, we, everyone talks, I mean, this is kind of like a really hot topic right now with parents. Um, I keep hearing people keep talking about coming to New Canaan for the high standards of the schools. And in order to maintain that, we've got to keep their class sizes low, and we really need this expansion. I mean, I've had kids in super teams and language classes with 26 kids learning Latin, and, you know, it's, there's so many, there's just, we need to do this project. I fully support it, and I thank you very much. I think I'm hearing a universal of feeling about this and appreciate very much the way you've gone back over the various statistics and all the figures and also appreciate that uh, it seems as if there are certain things that keep emerging as people ask questions about and I'm particularly glad you brought up tonight the idea that what will happen what's the extra cost that's involved just the cost that's involved not even the inconvenience and the hazards of having this go on and be two different projects but I hope people will understand that this is not something that we in any way would recommend and don't see any positive to it, that it will be an inevitable bad future if we do do it. I think the other one that has come up, which I, can, I can't believe still comes back, is the idea of somehow putting classrooms at the various elementary schools. And when we, tr when we actually put that out for the fifth grade, as recall, there were 12 classrooms to be divided into three schools, and we don't have any room on those campuses, particularly with the different uh, conditions that the soil has in different places 
and the room for putting those in there. So if, if you've heard any of those as being some sort of a logical solution why we didn't need the schools, I hope that that's destroyed for tonight so that people will understand that those are not good reasons against what's happening. I think that the idea, too, that I appreciate is the way that you've looked into and have had the assistance from people to be sure that we have what is this going to work out on a cost basis even for a year, and the figure that you have is $130 for the year. Is that right, per taxable unit? Uh, it was $148 on average per taxable unit, and it was uh, $13 per every $100,000 okay. of assessed value. So thank you. So you it's a, do every, you, everybody can do their own math. Is that, uh, <laughs> is that working out to a cup of coffee a week? That's, that's what I think I'm working it out to. Is that right? I think that's a way to look at it for people to consider. Can you give up one coffee a week that you're having out, and that would be paying for these schools? Putting it in terms like that makes it pretty clear, I think, to most people that we're, having, we're making sacrifices and compromises that really are not what we've done in the tradition of education in New Canaan. So we look to people to think those thoughts. The next thing we need to think about is that if you would like to move the vote for this, we can move the That'd vote. Be if you would like to do that, or it, we will go with the agenda, whichever the preference is. If, if there's a motion. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, I just said let's do it so that everybody can go. Yes, Moving so can now. we have a, mo oh, a motion then from Allison? So I'll, I'll move to we'll approve the Sachs Building Committee's recommended project. Oh, let's move it first. We need to vote to or move to it. We motion, to move that up. motion to move. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> let's, just, let's just go ahead and move it, and move it up, okay, on the agenda. We're changing our agenda. You have to just we move. We need a motion just to change the order. Generally, it's just if you're adding or. Oh, uh, just yeah. modify the agenda Whatever. to move that photo. Yes, up. that's what I'm saying. Just modify before, the agenda. Just before the presentation of the uh, finances. Yes. I think we. Right. Can we, we just a do a fast right motion, fast motion? Sure. Motion to a thank you. Agenda. Second. Thank you, Sherry. All in favor of changing? OK. Then that means that we're going to have the motion itself. Uh, we have the motion here. Do you want somebody want to say the motion? Yes. Sherry? Sure. I move to approve the Sachs Building Committee's recommended project as presented. I'm delighted to move to approve. Okay, a second on that. I see Jen's. Enthusiastically, I strongly. <laughs> I see Jen's hand go up. Second. Is there anybody has any other discussion that they want to add or advertise or say that they want to do? I think you've heard from all of us tonight and uh, how we feel about it, but let's get the real vote. How many? Hey, so I was just say, just the, our slogan that she had last do it once, do it right. That's, uh, that's, that's, those are our discussion terms then. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hands. And that's a unanimous vote of everyone here. Thank you very much for all your efforts. It's greatly appreciated. And we'll continue to hope for the best in the future and answer more questions if necessary. Thank you. Now going back to our agenda, we have Statement of accounts. And Dr. Keating, would you want to make any introduction, introduction on that or just she? Uh, no, I think we'll she toss can speak them all for over her. to Dr. Keating. She can speak for right. herself. Can I start? Please. All right. Well, before you, you have the second financial report for this current fiscal year. Uh, we have uh, currently spent 18.73% of our 83200000 $200,121,000 budget. We have encumbered 68.81% of that for a total of 87.54. So that really leaves only 12.46% of our budget that hasn't been encumbered, which is um, fairly good at this time of year. Some of the bigger items that have not been encumbered include um, the LAP insurance policy, which we just received from the town last week and the workers comp. So that's another 1% of our budget, which will be encumbered um, over the next few weeks. Uh, this report does include a transfer, and it is for a budgeted item. The budget included $20,500 um, within the salary account for tutors that are actually contracted out. So this is basically a reclassification of an item that you did budget within your budgeting um, cycle this year, but for uh, the reasons of reporting and balancing out our munis reports for payroll, we wanted to move it into the expense account. And then there was one small um, transfer for $553 uh, within one of the schools. 
I did want to mention to you that um, we are in the process of finishing up the audit. And uh, we had auditors in here last week. They were here for three days. And they spent quite a bit of time looking through our books. Uh, we did have some year-end reconciling items, which I mentioned when I gave you the year-end report. It was uh, given to you in draft format. There were four transactions that were recorded. And it actually ended up um, sending a few more dollars back to the town in our budget. Um, they really dealt with accruals. Uh, but at the end of the day, I was able to balance the general fund within seven cents to all of our transactions, so I felt really good about that. And all the other funds uh, balanced dried right out to zero. So with that, uh, we're in the process of making our final adjustments with the auditors, providing the town with any type of information that they may still need. Uh, we've sent them a tremendous amount of information. Sometimes things get crossed up, but we'll continue to respond to the requests and hopefully have this thing finished within the next few days. After that, we're going to get into a monthly reconciliation back again with the town and um, reconcile monthly, and hopefully all issues that were present in the past will be gone in the future. Awesome. Are there questions? Anyone have a question? Any questions from anyone? Looks very thorough, and, and, uh, and I would think that's an indication that everyone's looking at it and feeling that it's a lot of information. Are we still sending the, uh, this to all the Distribu uh, distribution people so that we can continue that communication with our various bo other boards. I know it's something new that we had started to do it with the other people, and if it's possible. Um, oh, yes, yeah. It's online. our standard process. That's terrific. Terrific. Thank you. Mm. We don't need to vote on this. No. Nope. So. But I do want to just take a very brief moment to commend Joanne on. Uh, the work here, I mean, these, these encumbrances, the work through the payroll, remembering that we are, we're not even a year in with our Munis payroll system, and Joanne jumped right in along with Tracy, our new budget director, and they've been working through all of this. At the same time, they are, they were closing out last year, they were doing this work forward into this year, they've been working with auditors, working with our audit committee, working with the town and establishing different lines of communication and sharing documentation back and forth. So really, it's um, Joanne, uh, jumped right in with both feet from day one. And uh, you know the detail here and the encumbrances and the, the budget management, you know, to have the 87 and a half percent spent or encumbered at this point really enables us to more more closely manage the budget as we go into the year and looking at that, you know, that the remaining percentage, mm -hmm. but also, you know, the money that's here. And it makes it makes a very big difference for us. So I just want to take a minute to see it's it's a lot of numbers, it's very dense, and we look at it and we can check it off and go through, but it's lots and lots of work and, and effort mm -hmm. that goes into putting all this together for us and getting us to this place this time. So great. thank you, Joe. Yeah. Very appreciated. Thank you. You're Looking at our next agenda item then, we have a donation. We do. So we, uh, as we did last year, we, we began the... the uh, process of accepting donations from the All Sports Booster Club in as the Board of Education and then we pay the volunteer coaches through our, our payroll. There are lots of advantages to doing that. So we had the request for the first donation uh, just late last week. came from Mike Murphy who's the president this year of the All Sports Booster Club. Uh, and this is a donation in the amount of $61,877.87. Uh, this will provide for 16 coaches uh, for the fall season, uh, the, we looked at the coaches and the distribution, and it's equally distributed in, in boys sports and girls sports. Uh, and it really, as you know, it really ena enables us to reduce the coach to athlete, student athlete uh, ratio, which really makes that uh, more of a learning opportunity for all of our students that are involved. You know, Jay Egan is the athletic director, has high standards mm -hmm. for our coaches and the practices and, the, and how they run the programs. And uh, this, the lower uh, student athlete to coach ratio helps us to really, again, make this an instructional opportunity for our students. So it really adds great value to our program for all of our students. It also helps us to uh, allow students who are interested at the sub-varsity level an opportunity to play. Uh, if we didn't have enough supervision with our coaches, we may have to be more selective on the number of students that are on our teams. And the All Sports Booster Club is very much committed to and aligned with our belief that wherever possible we want to offer as many uh, opportunities for our students as possible in our athletic program, just like we do with our academic program and co-curricular program at other times. So um, 
This very generous donation is the first. They anticipate making two more uh, for differing amounts, and one for the winter season, one for the spring season, mm -hmm. as we did last year. Um, and so I ask you to approve it. Yes. Said motion. Motion to approve the donation from the All Boosters Club and thank them again for the generous offer because I know sports, it's amazing how many kids in our school system are part of the sports system and it can only happen because of this type of generate, generous donation. So, thanks, motion. Is there a second on that? Jen, thank you. I wanted also in part of the discussion part just to say thank you again because if we're, I hope that people realize one of the things that people talk about is how we can afford the things in New Canaan that are being brought up. And I hope people realize as they watch this program how much this really is, just what Sangeeta says, how important it is to our sports. And we really appreciate that increased revenues to be able to do that. Uh, I think New Canaan's trying to think creatively about new revenue sources. And I think before we jump too quickly, but just to make sure to recognize those things that people are doing and helping the schools. So now we vote. All those in favor? Signify by raising your hands. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Well, thank Mike Murphy and the All Sports Booster Club. Yes, very, that's exactly. Very, thank you for the specific compliments. Mm -hmm. The consent agenda, we have a consent agenda here for um, uh, that's listed in front of you. Is there an motion for that consent agenda? A sherry? And a second? Allison? Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by raise. That's unanimous also. Uh, there are no comments from the public since I think the public has now all gone home. And announcements uh, at future meetings. Sure. I'd, I'd like to begin just by mentioning the, in front of you, you do have the, uh, the latest enrollment figures. These are the current enrollment figures as of today. Um, and just to just to direct you to the elementary school breakdown, and just because it was mentioned tonight briefly as the, the fifth mm -hmm. grade piece, um, you'll see that at east, south, and west, and it goes through the number of sections at each of the schools. And if you recall, uh, as we talk about this, 29 sections is our maximum number of sections at our elementary schools based on programming and facility and the constraints therein. Um, if you look over at East, we are running at 28 sections. Uh, over at South, we're running at 27 sections. And over at West, we are running at 26, but plus the, nerd, the um, preschool puts us at 29. So when we look at sort of current capacity in those schools, and if they were to think about sort of absorbing, uh, you figure our K-3 class size, max, the maximum is 20 students in a classroom. Mm -hmm. So really, you look at East as having maybe, if, 20 more students at most, given that facility. Mm -hmm. um, at South, you have a little bit more, and that would be 40 students over at South, given that facility. And over at West, uh, we are, we're maxed out as, as far as our number of sections go. So um, you know, we could add uh, individual students here and there within the grades, but as far as moving a, a new mm -hmm. grade over, um, you wouldn't have any space for them to begin with. Um, so I, I know that, you know, again, mm -hmm. in that conversation about uh, the fifth grade, uh, there's we're very close to our capacity at these schools, uh, again, 29 being the maximum number that we can hit. So I just wanted to make that point. Certainly, if there are any questions, Gary's here to, to answer them for us. But Certainly no room for 12 classes for the fifth grade, the present fifth grade, or for the... No. No. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, one other, one so, other yep. thing okay. that to mention is to recognize that CABE has recognized our given a mention of an honorable mention in the CABE Award of Excellence for Educational Communications. And for that, we want to especially thank our Communications Committee and Chair uh, Sherry West and Jen Richardson and Sangeeta Appel for all that you've done. And also, I want to give special credit to a person who's worked long and hard on the communications also, Dr. Litzy. so thank, thank you. you and uh, I don't know what this recognition means. Uh, there was no check with it, <laughs> <laughs> but it is quite an honor. And uh, we, I think the work that's been put in on the computers to make those very accessible to people, the communications for our budget so that everyone knew what was happening with the budgets, and now the communications that are happening to let people know about SACS and so they'll be active voters and understand about it. So it's a compliment to all of you and congratulations. Thank you. 
And last but not least, oh, actually, last and least. Is there any? Oh, good. If you don't Sorry. mind. No, that's okay. Um, yeah, and, and specifically, and we'll have our certificate, it'll come in and we can have it framed. Um, but it, it speaks to, uh, but there won't be a check with that either. <laughs> but it was about the, uh, the budget process and the communication strategy put together around the budget mm -hmm. process. You know, the idea of budget quick notes and the turnaround and, how, and the use of the website in order to communicate that mm -hmm. information um, which, you know, got us some recognition at the state level. So very nicely done, congratulations. Nice yes. job. I'll take nice 12 job. classrooms instead of a check. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good I'll offer. That. <laughs> That's a good offer. The, um, you know, just a couple of little things. Um, we mentioned certainly the town council meeting on the 21st. Um, tomorrow night, Chris Heron is coming to speak at the high school. Mm -hmm. um, and he'll also be speak. He'll be speaking with our students during the day. Actually, then have a, a different presentation for SACS for the seventh and eighth grade. I think it was during the day. And then tomorrow night, uh, he'll be here speaking with parents. Uh, Chris has quite a compelling story about his life as he grew up and played basketball and sort of and some decisions that he made along the way um, that I think came to uh, well life changing decisions for him. Uh, but he was there was a, a thirty on 30 or 34, 30, whatever, an ESPN special on Chris. Um, he's been speaking for a couple of years now to schools and to parents and communities mm -hmm. and should be very compelling. It's thanks to New Canaan Cares and Meg Domino um, putting together, helping to put together this program. So if people are available tomorrow night, I would suggest they come out to see that. Should be, should be quite a program. Um, we have our, of course, well, at the end of next week on the 30th, we have a Spirit Day. Uh, that they're putting together here at the high school and I know they do the same thing over at Saks and they have a spirit day and we'll have our Halloween parades and things as we have in the past which should be a lot of fun. Um, I do want to just mention to the board if you haven't filled out the doodle request uh, for the scheduled meeting that we're looking to put together uh, which we typically we typically do as there are new folks coming on the board and off mm -hmm. and I would uh, I'm hoping that we can have everybody make it to that meeting so if you have an opportunity to go to the the doodle, <laughs> sounds kind of funny to say, uh, please do so, so that we can go and get that scheduled. And if you don't have the link for it or anything else, let me know and I can certainly resend it to you. Um, and then coming up at our next board meeting, Gary mentioned we'll be talking about the enrollment, um, going through our staff utilization, which is always very important because it does start to set us up as we start to think about and talk more about budget and planning around staffing. As we know, our staff is a little over 81% of our total budget, uh, so it is the core of what we do. Uh, and we also have Zoe will be coming back to present for us that, that K-8 math curriculum presentation where mm -hmm. we have the good fortune. Zoe's now in her second year as a K-8 math coordinator. Mm -hmm. So she, she can come and she'll share with us that look um, K-8 and talk us through some of the sort of the progression through the curriculum as it goes. So Terrific. Terrific. thank you for that. Very exciting. Uh, as we end this meeting. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, I think I was checking the schedule before we came, and while we usually meet every other uh, week, I don't think we're meeting the Monday before uh, the election. So I think our next meeting is right. after is the election, be the with ninth. the new board. The no, that's the 16th. No. It's with the 16th. It's with the right. So according to our bylaws, um, mm -hmm. it is two weeks after the election that the new members would be seated. All so right. on the 9th, um, our existing board will still be here to hear the presentation and for the staff utilization. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that one clarification. One <laughs> yes, it's an important clarification, so thank you for yes. asking the question. It's a and perk uh, for us, you. Allison, to have you right. for another Otherwise, meeting. we might have had another That's item on the agenda. <laughs> now, at this point, uh, is Always there a motion to that. adjourn? Motion thank to you, adjourn. Thank you, Penny, and second. Thank you, Sangeeta. All in favor? And that's unanimous. And thank you all very much.